The growth of the Five Guys Burgers and Fries chain is nothing short of amazing, and the story behind it will make you believe anything is possible. With founders who have remained an integral part of their company, franchisees who aren't just buying a brand name but an entire formula, and a company built from the ground up, Five Guys has a story that embraces what the American dream once was, and still can be. Choosing to Cook Five Guys' founding father, Jerry Morrell, hails from a middle-class Michigan family, which encouraged him to go to college. He didn't enjoy his own educational experience much, though, so when it came time to send his sons to college, he gave them a choice. The money he'd saved for their education was theirs, and they could either each go to college or, as a family, decide to pool the money to start a restaurant. Not only would it give his kids a legacy, but it would let them work together, and their limited menu concept was a sweeping success. We stuck to our guns, kept it simple, and uh, the, press, the press liked this. What's in a name? The name Five Guys couldn't be more straightforward. Morell and his sons decided on the name to describe themselves. Father Jerry, sons Matt, Jim, and Chad from his first marriage, and son Ben from his second. But when youngest son Tyler was born, the name didn't quite fit anymore, so he unofficially removed himself from the name roster so that the five guys he refers to are his kids. And all remain key players in the business. While their father oversees everything, Jim and Matt travel the country and visit locations. Chad is in charge of training, Ben works with the franchise owners and selects new applicants, and Tyler runs the bakery. Morell's second wife, Janie, is also involved in the business as their bookkeeper. Finding a Franchise Five Guys opened its doors in 1986, and it's only continued to grow ever since. The chain saw an almost unthinkable 792% growth between 2006 and 2012, but that global expansion almost didn't happen. At first, the Morells, especially Jerry, were content with opening just a few restaurants in the same area. They had complete control, kept the menu the same, and experimented with very few new things. But Matt bought a copy of Franchising for Dummies, written by Wendy's Dave Thomas. And at the same time, former Washington Redskins kicker Mark Mosley was pondering the future of his own burger joint. In a case of right place, right time, Mosley got on board with five guys and kicked off their franchising efforts. They found out quickly how right of a decision it was when franchising rights in Virginia sold out in three days, and the rest is fast food history. No timers there are a ton of things to keep track of in any kitchen, but take a close look at any Five Guys kitchen and you'll notice there's something missing. Timers. Jerry Morell says they're not necessary because good cooks know when a burger is done. Those burgers are thin for a reason, too, and that dates back to the early days of Five Guys. The first burgers they experimented with were thicker, but they dried out too fast. So thinner burgers gave them the taste and texture they were looking for, and patrons seemed to enjoy the choice. No VIP deliveries Getting a phone call from the U.S. government might ordinarily throw a restaurant into a tailspin, but when Five Guys was asked for 15 burgers to be delivered to the Pentagon, Morrell refused. He told QSR, We've never had a delivery service. We don't believe in it. We think it cheapens the product. Not only did they refuse, but they hung a massive banner outside their Arlington store that read, Absolutely no delivery. Putting a sign in your window that says we deliver is a sign that you're probably maybe in trouble. The move was risky since the Pentagon's 26,000 employees were a huge part of the location's customer base, but it worked. Business reportedly went up about 20%, and even Barack Obama stopped by in 2009, after they also refused to offer any delivery service to the White House because some foods are worth trekking out for. We gotta go get some burgers. Fresh fries. Five Guys gets their potatoes almost exclusively from Idaho, and only north of the 42nd parallel to boot. The, those potatoes grow slower than a potato from the south, which makes them denser. They buy so many of them, they account for 5% of the entire state's potato sales. Two months of the year, however, the growing season dictates they switch to Washington state potatoes. And the reason their fries are so tasty goes well beyond source consistency. After hand-cutting them, Five Guys Fry crew members give the raw potatoes a three-minute power wash to get rid of the extra starch. And they're pre-cooked for two and a half minutes before being cooled for anywhere from 10 minutes to a few hours. Once they're ordered, they're finished off with another two to three minutes in the fryer, shaken off exactly 15 times, and served up to the customers. 
mystery shoppers. There's a lot about the way Five Guys does business that's unconventional, and that includes their approach to getting the word out. According to Bestmark, the reason you've never seen a Five Guys commercial or billboard is that they use that cash to hire mystery shoppers to visit their restaurants and do a full evaluation. This keeps employees on their toes, ensures their customers have a great experience, and those experiences turn into word-of-mouth advertising. Anyone who's worked in retail knows just how terrifying the prospect of a mystery shopper is but Five Guys turns it into a major rewards program. Director of Communications and Marketing Molly Catalano told QSR Magazine they hand out a huge amount of money as bonuses for meeting mystery shopper goals. Every week, the top 200 restaurants are each given between $900 and $1,300 to split among employees, which means there's a chance they can win a bonus every single week. That's quite an incentive to hustle. So, if your local Five Guys crew seem to keep some serious pep in their steps during your next visit, it might be because they suspect you're a shopper spy that might earn them some extra cash. Chances are, if you've ever been to In-N-Out Burger, you were sold after your first bite. That toasted sponge bread, the never-frozen patty, the grilled onions, the secret sauce. It's the antithesis of most drive through burgers. It's no surprise that the chain that has long been heralded the IT fast food restaurant since its opening in 1948 has managed to gain a cult following that other burger joints could only wish to achieve. What is the longest you would queue for this burger? Three hours, four, five. Though there's plenty of talk of the chain's not-so-secret menu, there might be a few unknown tidbits that even the biggest aficionados don't know about their beloved burger spot. We're digging into some surprising In-N-Out burger facts, but be warned, you might get a little hungry. <laughs> Why are people so devoted to this? You sound like someone who's never had an In-N-Out burger. <laughs> How to really animal style. We all know the animal-style french fry menu hack by now, with all that melty cheese, grilled onions, and special sauce. But there's a way to avoid the imminent soggy potato pile. A former In-N-Out manager known by the alias Kathy told Thrillist, if you're going to eat animal fries, the best thing to do is to order them fry well, because the fries will hold their shape. They won't get soft and mushy under all the sauce, especially if you take your time eating them. Now that's a useful hack. There are several sacred things in this world that you don't ever mess with. One of them happens to be another man's fries. The secret secret menu. Any In-N-Out fan knows all about the usual not-so-secret menu items by now, but there are a few lesser-known menu hacks that still fly under the radar. According to a Redditor at the helm of In-N-Out AMA, you can order a mustard-fried patty, which happens when the cooks add mustard to the meat while it's grilling and add pickles to the bottom bun. Only like meat and cheese? That's a Flying Dutchman, which is just two patties with cheese melted between them, nothing else. Can't decide what flavor of shake to get? Go Neapolitan with all three flavors in one cup. Special deals for law enforcement. In a revealing AMA, a Redditor claiming to be an In-N-Out Burger associate shed some light on the employee's freebie situation, saying, Associates get a free meal every shift. We can order anything up to the size of a double-double. However, we can't order animal fries or shakes unless we pay for them ourselves. We also can't give discounts to friends or families. The commenter went on to explain who does get a discount, saying, The only discount we do give out is a police officer discount. We only give police officers discounts if they're in uniform, too. Otherwise, no discount. This is because seeing an officer in uniform in the restaurant makes customers feel safer, apparently. Maybe that's why the Hamburglar hangs around a different burger joint. Mm, New on the menu. In-N-Out's famously simple menu hasn't changed in about 15 years, so fans were excited to see the addition of hot cocoa in January 2018. Though the drink isn't exactly new. According to the Orange County Register, In-N-Out President Lindsay Snyder said in a statement, this is actually the return of hot cocoa. My grandparents, Harry and Esther Snyder, served it for many years beginning in the 50s. I'm not sure how it fell off the menu, but it's part of our culture and something special for kids. And I'm happy that we're bringing it back. The 8-ounce cup is made with Ghirardelli cocoa powder and topped with mini marshmallows. And it's back for good at all locations. Secret Messages If you've ever looked under your In-N-Out cup, you might have spied what looks like a Bible verse. And spoiler alert, it is a Bible verse. Behold his mighty hand! The soda cups cite John 3.16, the milkshake cups mention Proverbs 3.5, and even the burger wrappers and fry trays sport a verse. Hmm. This is a tasty burger. The company's founding family, including now President Lindsay Snyder, are known for their strong religious beliefs. People reports that the burger heiress's faith saved her life, saying, 
I really value the love and good times I had with my dad, but even that can't compare completely to the love that God has for me. God got me back up after all these failures and he can lift me up and see me go forward, and I know that he can be glorified. She even also has two tattoos citing Bible verses, but not the ones on in and outs packaging. At the end of the day, you know, I'm looking to big guy upstairs of what, what he would want to. Famous chefs are loving it. There's a reason In-N-Out has a cult following. It's good food. Paris Hilton even got a DUI trying to satisfy a craving in 2006. I was just really hungry and I wanted to have an In-N-Out burger. But you might be surprised which legendary chefs are also down to double-double. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit. First We Feast reported that Julia Child was such a fan, she carried a list of store locations around with her and even sent an assistant out on a burger run while she was in the hospital. Napa Valley chef and restaurateur Thomas Keller certainly knows how to party, once tweeting, celebrated the French Laundry's anniversary with, what else, In-N-Out burgers. He also told the site, My first experience at In-N-Out Burger inspired me to do a hamburger restaurant. I've had it in the back of my mind for 16 years, but I haven't gotten around to it. It's kind of a secret fantasy. And the notoriously cranky Gordon Ramsay also approves. The uh, last burger I had was uh, In-N-Out Burger. He told Eater, People think Americans are obese and burgers are bad for them. They are delicious. In-N-Out burgers were extraordinary. I was so bad, I sat in the restaurant, had my double cheeseburger, then minutes later I drove back around and got the same thing again to take away. And even the food world's saltiest critic, Anthony Bourdain, digs In-N-Out, telling Eater that it's his favorite place to eat in LA. Managers make bank. Considering a career change, you might want to think about In-N-Out. He lives in North Hollywood on Radford near the In-N-Out burger. Oh, the In-N-Out burgers on camera. Near the In-N-Out burger. Those are good burgers, Walter. Shut the f*** up, Donnie. The California Sun reported that the burger chain's managers make more than $160,000 per year on average, not to mention paid vacations, health insurance, vision and dental, and 401k plans. VP of Operations Denny Warnick explained in a statement that the company's founders wanted employees to focus on quality service, saying, Paying their associates well was just one way to help maintain that focus, and those beliefs remain firmly in place with us today. The company even sends their new managers to In-N-Out University. Yes, it's a real thing. And the fast food restaurant also promotes internal advancement, giving associates the opportunity to climb the ladder even without a college degree. As of March 2018, your future in burgers starts at $13 per hour. High-end swag. If you're really, really into In-N-Out, a regular old t-shirt just might not cut it. Maybe you're looking for something with a little more pizzazz. Well, look no further than Vault 48, the curated merch section of their shop, offering, quote, a collection of unique items fit for the most avid In-N-Out burger fan. It is a treasure trove of fancy swag. We're talking about Swarovski crystal keychains plated in rose gold and emblazoned with the palm tree logo and a $125 jewelry box for all your In-N-Out bling, also encrusted in crystals and featuring those famous palm trees. Okay, there are a lot of palm tree logos, but hey, hardcore fans gotta represent. The heiress to the burger fortune. It's about the quality, the friendliness, and the cleanliness. We keep it simple. She's called the Burger Heiress. At just 35, she inherited the company and instantly became a billionaire. But In-N-Out president Lindsay Snyder is notoriously private and tends to stay out of the limelight. Because we don't want to be in the spotlight. We don't want a bunch of attention and we want to do what we do best and that's serve some good burgers to our customers. But over the years, she's provided a little glimpse into her personal life. Where I felt more alone than ever, more of a piece of trash than ever. Snyder said that her father's passing due to an overdose of painkillers caused her to fill the huge void with men, drugs, and alcohol. She ultimately turned to God, saying, I realized that I'm gonna follow in the footsteps of my father and that I'm gonna meet an early death if I do not get right with God. After three failed marriages, she met her current husband, Sean Ellingson. Together with Ellingson, the mom of four channeled her faith and formed the Army of Love Ministry, who provide resources and referrals to those in need. But she already had a family history of taking care of people. My heart is totally connected to this company because of my family and the fact that they're not here you know, I have a, a strong tie to keep this the way they would want it. So what does she do to unwind? The Burger Maven drag races. You can catch the America's youngest female billionaire racing a car at as much as 170 miles an hour. She told Orange Coast Magazine, I'm a lot like my dad, a little bit of a daredevil. I like an adrenaline rush. My dad took me to the racetrack for the first time when I was two or three. Anything with a motor, that was in my blood. Okay, fast cars and maybe just a little bit of that special sauce. In and out, in and out, that's what a hamburger is all about. 
you're craving donuts, can you think of anything better than a Krispy Kreme? That flawless sheet of glaze that crackles across the top when you take your first bite? The light pillowy pastry that almost dissolves in your mouth the moment it hits your tongue? Whether you're looking to satisfy your breakfast cravings or a late night sweet tooth, it always hits the spot. And when they're hot off the line, forget about it. While we may never know what makes these things so delicious, there are plenty of other fun facts to discover about your favorite donut chain that's been serving those glazed delights for over 80 years. Here's the untold truth of Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme donuts are so good, if I told you right now they had crack in it, you go, I knew something was up. That hot light. If the sight of the lit hot light in the Krispy Kreme window makes you weak in the knees, you're not alone. But if you're under the impression that the neon light means you get a free donut, you're likely to be disappointed. Krispy Kreme's communications department revealed to the Lish, the hot light signals that donuts are hot and fresh coming off the line, not a free donut. Some shops sometimes offer samples, but that isn't dependent on the hot light being on. These days, thanks to the Krispy Kreme app, you can be notified every time a location in your area turns on their light. Road trips just got a whole lot more donut-y. Donut beer? Two Florida breweries, Hidden Spring Aleworks and Arcane Aleworks, collaborated to produce a Russian Imperial Stout infused with Krispy Kreme donuts. Given that stout beer is known for its coffee and chocolate notes, we can only assume this is a match made in heaven. While Krispy Kreme wasn't directly involved, the company reportedly supports the product in the breweries. The beer, called Donut Quote Me On This, was brewed in two batches, one with glazed and one with cream-filled donuts. Josh Garman, Hidden Springs founder and brewer, told the Tampa Bay Times, "...it's going to be roasty, chocolatey, hopefully with some donut flavor. We're actually hoping to get some of the glaze from the Krispy Kremes to come through." The stout debuted in January 2018 and promptly sold out, but we're hoping these tasty brews make a second appearance soon. Until then, we have the old standby. Coffee and donuts! Oh. Boom! It's a party! Don't join the club. When your company has already eschewed the proper spelling of crispy and cream, you might figure it's fine to take it a step further and spell club with a K. But unfortunately, one British Krispy Kreme store did just that, and in a huge marketing fail, named one of their promotional kids' days KKK Wednesdays. Let's call the police. And tell them what? An army of killer donuts is on the loose? Predictably, there were plenty of complaints, pointing out that the name was the same as the abbreviation for the American hate group, the Ku Klux Klan. A spokesperson for the company told The Guardian, Krispy Kreme apologizes unreservedly for the inappropriate name of a customer promotion at one of our stores. This promotion was never intended to cause offense. All material has been withdrawn, and an internal investigation is currently underway. Donuts over cake How many weddings have you been to where the cake is just a huge disappointment in the flavor department? But you can't have a wedding without a multi-tiered dessert, right? Thanks to the Krispy Kreme Donut Tower, there's now a solution to that age-old wedding cake conundrum. And trust us, nobody will miss the tasteless red velvet when they're biting into a delectable glazed donut. Things are gonna be different. I'm gonna be on you every day. Have you got that? Every day! Mmm. Availability varies by store, and you can even customize the tower by adding in any variety of donuts you choose. Even if your local store doesn't offer the service, a donut tower is easy to build with a tiered cake stand. Select stores also offer individually packaged donuts as wedding favors, and for those throwing baby showers, there are gender reveal donuts with pink or blue filling. Shaq's Love Affair Shaquille O'Neal has had a long-time love affair with Krispy Kreme. Surprise! Hi! Oh my god, you look like Shaquille O'Neal! You might remember his hilarious 2009 video set to Mariah Carey's We Belong Together, ultimately proving that he has the willpower not to break his basketball season diet. But now that he's retired, Shaq can eat all the donuts he wants. And in 2016, he not only became the new owner of an Atlanta-area Krispy Kreme, he also became the brand's global ambassador. Shaq said in a statement, Krispy Kreme prides itself on spreading joy and supporting local communities. And that's a cause that I am thrilled to be a part of. Our goal is to help people find their happy place. And what better way than with a box of delicious Krispy Kreme donuts? But he's not stopping there. In 2017, he told TMZ, I only own one now, but I'm working on it. Uh, when it's all said and done, I like to own about 100. Black Market Donuts? At one time, the border town of Juarez, Mexico was graced with a Krispy Kreme restaurant. And of course, the residents quickly got hooked. So much so that when the store closed, it provided the perfect opportunity for the Krispy Kreme familia to set up shop. And just like that, the donut black market was born. What is that private pile? Sir, jelly donuts, sir! 
Sonia Garcia and her two sons drive across the border to El Paso, Texas to stock up on 40 boxes of Krispy Kreme donuts each night, then drive back into Juarez to sell them at a 60% markup. When asked why these donuts are so highly sought after when it's easier to get other kinds locally, Garcia told the Los Angeles Times, I don't know why, but these are just softer and better. Sugar Bomb Breakfast Donuts get a bad rap when it comes to sugar, but newsflash, if you're sucking down a grande frappuccino every morning, you're drinking as much sugar as you'd get by eating a half dozen Krispy Kremes. Oh, sugar rush. Sorry, Starbucks fans, but those blended drinks are chock full of the sweet stuff. And we're not just talking about the 59 grams of sugar in the unicorn frappuccino. A plain old coffee frappuccino comes in at 50 grams. And the vanilla version actually blows the unicorn out of the water with an astounding 69 grams of sugar. When you compare those numbers to the 10 grams of sugar in an original glazed Krispy Kreme, you can feel pretty good about scarfing down a few donuts as a morning treat. The Luther Burger Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger! Can I take your order? <laughs> What do you get when you combine two Krispy Kreme original glazed donuts with a beef patty, cheese, and bacon? You get the Luther Burger. And don't be fooled by its decadent appearance. It might look like it would set you back thousands of calories, but surprisingly, it has just 500. According to Snopes, the burger is named after R&B singer Luther Vandross. But the reason behind the naming of the sandwich is less clear. One theory suggests that Vandross himself invented the concoction after running out of regular buns, substituting donuts in their place. Another theory suggests it was simply one of his favorite foods. Whatever the reason, we know one thing for sure. Paula Deen did not invent this dish, although she did attempt to take credit years after the Luther Burger was already being served at Mulligan's Pub in Georgia. Enjoy the special sauce! Those buns are all still good, just change the hats! That limited a dish. Krispy Kreme might have plenty of mouth-watering options to choose from, but that doesn't stop them from releasing limited edition donuts any chance they get. You got jack o lantern jack o lantern whether it's a holiday, an event, or just because, there is a constant stream of fun new flavors and colors popping up. St. Patrick's Day saw the original glaze go green, and the dough itself was turned a vibrant shade of lime for the occasion. The 2018 Winter Olympics prompted a gold donut, with bits of Hershey's gold candy bars sprinkled on top of salted caramel icing. And then there was the Simpsons Donut, a real-life recreation of Homer's favorite snack. Even the once-in-a-lifetime solar eclipse of 2017 inspired a limited-edition donut. Jackie Woodward, the company's chief marketing officer, said in a statement, "...the solar eclipse is a rare occasion providing a total sensory experience for viewers across the continental U.S. Chocolate will have the same effect as we introduce a first-time chocolate glazing of our iconic original glazed donut. The chocolate glazed donut is a delicious way to experience the solar eclipse." no matter where you are, and we can't wait for fans to try it. And as sad as it is to see these limited editions disappear, we're sure not hating on our old faves. Oh, gotta run, the hot light's on at our local shop. Chick-fil-A, the southern-based quick-serve restaurant known for charity, controversy, and really good chicken, is rapidly expanding throughout the U.S. There's a lot of information out there about one of America's favorite fast chicken stops, but you don't know the whole story until now. The surprising bestseller. Can you guess what the top selling item is at Chick fil A? And stop right there. Wrong. It's the waffle fries. Sounds insane, right? But look at it this way what is offered with every combo meal? Sure, you can substitute that kale thing or some other side, but let's be real. How many people can head to a fast food joint of any kind and resist the fries? The French fries are pretty good. French fried potatoes? Yep, French fries. That might have been a bit of a trick question. So how about this one? Which main menu item sells the best? It shouldn't come as too much of a shock, but the most popular chicken item at Chick-fil-A is the original chicken sandwich. Thanks in part to all the options, it beats nuggets hands down. There's nothing like the old, reliable, original chicken sandwich for countless customers. Barbecue sauce failure Chick-fil-A might have thought a change to their barbecue sauce in 2016 would go over pretty well, but people had, well, strong opinions about the switch from original to smokehouse. Someone console me. Chick-fil-A changed their barbecue sauce and my life is ruined. So sad. Fans took to extreme measures to get their point across, and after months of social media protests and what might just be the only online petition that ever actually worked, Chick-fil-A caved and announced they were bringing back the original barbecue sauce. Fans are serious. Hey Chick-fil-A, tell whoever came up with the idea to change your barbecue sauce that they maybe shouldn't have any more ideas. Ouch. 
quick cooking. So what's the secret to Chick-fil-A? How do they make delicious chicken happen so fast? Fortunately for fans, Chick-fil-A president Dan Cathy spilled the beans on the real trick to how they get it done and just how they stumbled on the quick cooking idea. The Dwarf Grill was the original restaurant of Chick-fil-A founder Truett Cathy, and they started out serving workers on their break from the nearby Ford plant. Workers didn't have a lot of time to wait around for chicken to fry up for 15 minutes, so they developed a method of pressure cooking the chicken, then serving it up on a bun. They not only created what Kathy says was the first chicken sandwich, but it got everyone in and out quickly, was tasty, and was an absolute win. It takes about four minutes to cook up a Chick-fil-A sandwich, and that's the same method they still use today. Has being anti-LGBT hurt? The biggest court in the land is the court of public opinion and social media. And in June 2018, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey fell afoul of it when he tweeted an image that implied he ordered Chick-fil-A during LGBT Pride Month. Dorsey apologized, of course, and that's just one instance of outrage frequently directed at the notoriously conservative chain. So are they hurting their business by being so public about their personal views? The short answer is no. Sales have almost doubled since 2012, the year Chick-fil-A's anti-gay marriage backing became national news. Calls went out for Chick-fil-A protests and boycotts, but that press attention may have worked in their favor. It's possible that people who had never visited a Chick-fil-A became curious what the place was about and discovered a food they liked in the process. Meanwhile, President Dan Cathy has tried to take the sting out of some of the worst of his statements and says he's not the hate monger he's made out to be. I've been able to reach out to, to people in the gay community and sit down and have some incredibly wonderful dialogue with them. Chick-fil-A hamburgers Don't tell the cows, but you can order a hamburger at a few Chick-fil-A's. How can they stoop to such dirty marketing deeds? Well, technically, it's not a Chick-fil-A, but it kinda is. Truett Cathy opened his first questionably named Dwarf Grill in 1946, later renamed it Dwarf House, and in case you're wondering, they all come complete with a tiny little door. The hateful Georgia location still exists today with a Chick-fil-A appendage on the original restaurant, and it's just one of 11 locations in the Atlanta area. And yes, the Dwarf House was one of many diners in the South boasting a full-service menu. To the dismay of the Chick-fil-A cows, the traditional diner fare included hamburgers, and it still does. Can we keep this one quiet? Franchisees don't get rich. No chain restaurant rakes it in like Chick-fil-A. Taking in just under 3.2 million gross revenue per store in 2012, the average Chick-fil-A can outgross even the mighty McDonald's. The franchise fee for Chick-fil-A is, as of 2018, a minuscule $10,000. That means owning a store as a franchise is a highly sought-after commodity. But potential owners shouldn't expect the luxuries that usually accompany the high life. There are some downsides, starting with the moment corporate picks the spot and buys the land where the restaurant goes. They'll own that forever, and franchisees will never have a chance to buy it from them. Everything at the location is rented to the franchisee for a 15% pre-tax sales fee. And on top of that, a whopping 50% of gross profits heads to the home office in Atlanta. To put that in perspective, the industry standard is for corporate to take between 5 and 10% of gross sales. They also demand that owners not just be a name on a sign somewhere. If you own a Chick-fil-A, they want you to be hands-on and promise to fall in line with all of their beliefs, including closing on Sundays. Still, the overwhelming majority of Chick-fil-A franchise owners keep their stores for life, even though they won't spend those lives as millionaires. Will they go public? Investors might be craving the chance to get their hands on some Chick-fil-A stock, but the Cathy family has steadfastly maintained that just ain't gonna happen. No! God, please, no! 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 Founder Truett Cathy died in 2014 after a long career, first behind the counter, then at the helm of a massive chain. But before he passed, he made a deal with his children that would make sure the devoutly religious beliefs and family values that he founded the company on would remain intact. His heirs can sell the chain, but it must remain private. Why keep his kin from the potential billions in windfall? It's impossible to tell for sure just what the conversation was. But industry analysts at Business Insider suggest it's because Kathy knew that publicly, Chick-fil-A would be beholden to shareholders and the opinions of others who might not share his family's conservative views. They point out Chick-fil-A's corporate statement to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. That would have to change if they ever went public, and they suggest that change is a huge part of the reason their founder wanted them to stay private. Calorie-heavy sauce 
It's not unheard of for people to squirrel away a few packets of Chick-fil-A sauce to apply to their own home cooking. There are copycat recipes available, but let's be honest, they're never quite the same, are they? A word of warning, though, before you go and crank up your own homemade awesomeness with a pack or two of the real deal, you might want to consider investing in an elliptical. A solitary, tiny little one-ounce packet of Chick-fil-A sauce is a whopping 140 calories. All American Chick-fil-A has only really had major success in America, even though they have ventured into international territories in the past. They pulled out of their short-lived South African venture in 2001, and it wasn't until 2014 they went international again, while still staying close to home. That's when they opened a Canadian location in the Calgary airport, which is admittedly not the first thing you think of when you start talking about north of the border. Chick-fil-A has had better luck in airports than in actually setting up shop overseas, and if the response to the 2018 news they were moving to Toronto is any judge, it might have something to do with the fact they're known as the controversial American chicken joint. So for now, they're sticking mostly to their home turf, with Alaska, Hawaii, and Vermont being the last states without a Chick-fil-A. Why Vermont? Hey, it's a strange place. Do we? Oh, go girlfriend, I'm your mother. Come on, Thorny, you're losing to the rookie. It's embarrassing. Come on, rabbit. Giving away. If you really want free Chick-fil-A, there's an app for that, and it rewards you for using the platform with free food items after you reach certain thresholds. That's the easy way, but there's another way to get free grub. If you're one of the first 100 people at a new Chick-fil-A grand opening, you'll receive a coupon for one free meal a week for a year. People take that seriously. If you want to get free food the really hard way, how about being born there? After one woman gave birth in a San Antonio Chick-fil-A in 2018, they promised the baby free food for life. Happy birthday! Chick-fil-A also isn't above giving away food for a worthy cause. And sometimes, human tragedy even outweighs their own rules about closing on Sundays. In 2016, after the tragic Pulse nightclub shootings in Orlando, Chick-fil-A not only broke their Sunday rules, but they reached across what had previously been a major boundary. A location near the club opened their kitchens and delivered food to first responders and to those donating blood on the Sunday after the attacks. Stores have also helped on the scenes of other natural disasters, from hurricanes to tornadoes, reaching out to help the community no matter what day of the week. That Chick-fil-A sauce. Given the tight reins placed upon franchises, you wouldn't expect a lot of independent thought allowed in the stores. But the Chick-fil-A powers recognized it when good stuff came out of a store in Virginia. As unlikely as it sounds, there were originally no dipping sauces with the chicken nuggets. Until, that is, Hugh Fleming saw a need. He was whipping up his own honey mustard for the nuggets, and later, by a happy accident, it was mixed in with the location's standard barbecue sauce. It was a massive hit, and people were pretty upset that was the only Chick-fil-A that carried it. Chick-fil-A tried to make a copycat version on their own, and while Honey Roasted Barbecue wasn't bad, it wasn't Mr. Fleming's sauce either. In 2007, Fleming gave Chick-fil-A the recipe, literally, as in he doesn't take any royalties for the sauce. Chick-fil-A took it national, renamed it, and now they go through more than 84 million packets a year. Shopping Mall Staple in the 1980s and 90s, the shopping mall was the place to hang, no matter what time of the year. Malls across the country were hugely popular going back into the 60s, so it's easy to see how opening the first Chick-fil-A in Atlanta's Greenbrier Mall was a great business decision. The idea behind Chick-fil-A was quite an innovation, and it opened at a time when malls were for shopping and eating happened elsewhere. Kathy noticed the shift to indoor mall shopping, especially in muggy Atlanta, and figured people would eat there as well. They did, and Kathy used the mall location to introduce the public to his unique chicken sandwich. It was popular, obviously, and from there, Chick-fil-A moved to other malls throughout the Southeast. It wasn't until 1986 that Chick-fil-A constructed their first standalone store. And while corporate experimented with drive through only locations, they ultimately decided the brick-and-mortar walk-in model was the way to go. Chick-fil-A continues to expand, so if there's not one near you, there probably will be soon. Since first opening in 1983, Hooters has become a cultural icon. You might think you know all there is to know about the franchise, but there's a lot more to it than just Hooters girls and chicken wings. Let's dive in and find out the truth about Hooters. Hooters at Home Hooters knows the revealing uniforms of their waitresses don't appeal to everyone. According to the New York Post, Hooters chief executive Terry Mark said, Many people wouldn't step foot in our restaurants, but they want our product. In order to broaden their client base, the franchise announced it was expanding its delivery and pickup services in January 2018. Hooters Stars 
The restaurant has been a launching pad for many now-famous celebrities who worked there before they got their big break. Former Hooters girls include actress Naya Rivera and model Samantha Burke. Actress Amy Adams also worked at Hooters, first as a hostess when she was 17 and later as a waitress. Adams told Vanity Fair that she only made it three weeks as a waitress, claiming that she, quote, learned quickly that short shorts and beer don't mix. She added, The nicest guy walking in is not necessarily the nicest guy after two pitchers of beer. Exempt from the law a class-action lawsuit was brought against Hooters in the 90s, alleging discrimination in their hiring policies. The lawsuit was filed by several men who had been denied jobs by the company. While Hooters paid out a total settlement of $3.75 million and agreed to open up more jobs to any gender, they were not ordered to hire men as waitstaff. As Business Insider explained, while gender-based hiring is generally not allowed under the law, Hooters claim that hiring women as Hooters girls is a necessary aspect of their business model. In a statement, Hooters said, While we offer world-famous wings and burgers, the essence of our business is the Hooters girl and the experience she provides to our customers. Hooters girls are entertainers. Most popular attraction While many people might go to Hooters for the pretty women, some clients claim to be drawn in by the food, especially their chicken wings. While co-founder Ed Droste admitted that Hooters wasn't the first to serve the chicken wing, he noted they did help to popularize them. Back then, wings were a throwaway. No one served them anywhere. Since the restaurant opened in 1983, chicken wings have become a staple in bars everywhere and still count for a large portion of Hooters sales. Inexperienced Founders the Hooters founders basically had no idea what they were doing when they opened the restaurant, as none of them had been in the restaurant business before. Drosty told USA Today, We were six clueless knuckleheads who called ourselves the Hooters Six. We wanted to open a neighborhood joint with a beach theme that we couldn't get kicked out of. Drosty said that on opening day, he had to call a friend to show the crew how to light the fryers. They also broke the law that day. He revealed, I paid two fake cops to bust one of my partners because we didn't even have our beer license yet. Tuition Assistance Hooters offers excellent benefits to their employees, including help with paying for school. Courtney Dietz, who worked for Hooters for several years, told Cosmopolitan about her experience working at the restaurant, saying, Hooters helps pay for books and schooling, so it's really awesome. You have to work up to it. If you're there for a year or two, they offer scholarships, too. My managers would let me do homework in the office as long as I was taking care of my tables. Times are changing. Hooters' business model has proven to be successful for more than three decades, but nothing lasts forever. Lately, they've had trouble gaining a following among the millennial generation. Millennials are less likely to frequent casual dining chains than people of their parents' generation. Business Insider claims millennials are also, quote, less interested in breasts than their elders. For these reasons, Hooters has started to rethink their brand. The franchise is working on expanding their menu and updating their decor to appeal to the younger demographic. No matter how many late-night stops you make at Taco Bell, there is probably a lot you still don't know about the fast food chain. When you're hungry for a burrito supreme. From how the Doritos Locos Tacos was invented to some of the chain's zaniest promotions, these Taco Bell tidbits will have you hitting the drive-thru in no time. Welcome to Taco Bell. May I take your order? Yeah, a Taco Bell grande. At some point in the 1990s, you probably saw one of those Taco Bell commercials that featured a precious little chihuahua named Gidget, a $500 million advertising campaign all told. Yo quiero Taco Bell. Though the commercials aired constantly, they didn't actually increase sales. Ooh. In fact, it cost the company in more ways than one. In 2003, two men claimed they'd created the concept of the Taco Bell dog and sued the company for $42 million. Who wouldn't want to take credit for the concept? Sir, don't be silly. Drop the chalupa. I said, drop the chalupa. Put it down, man! Yeah, drop the chalupa. Taco Bell eventually settled the case out of court, and Gidget passed away in 2009, at the ripe old age of 15. Her trainer claimed the Taco Bell gig basically ruined her career, noting that, she was kind of typecast, so she never really got much work after that. That's not to say her career was completely derailed by the campaign. After all, Gidget also starred in Legally Blonde 2 in 2003, fearlessly playing Bruiser, a brave and challenging role for any pooch to tackle. All the signs were there, I just didn't see them. You know, most dogs like to chew your shoes, and Bruiser like to wear mine. Oh, and we should probably mention that Gidget also had a bit role in Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Honestly, a lot of actors would kill for that resume. You've heard of a bed and breakfast, so why can't the world have a Taco Bell hotel? The chain decided to give the zany idea a whirl, opening up the Bell, a Taco Bell hotel and resort from August 8th to August 12th, 2019. Talk about thinking outside the bun. The California oasis of Palm Springs plays host to Taco Bell's hotel and resort, the Bell. Guess who successfully nabbed a reservation? Got to enjoy an ever so tiny Taco Bell themed room. You'll notice every space has been curated with unique Taco Bell touches. 
The hotel, which usually operates as the V Palm Springs Resort, was decked out with Taco Bell memorabilia, a Taco Bell gift shop, and a Taco Bell nail salon. As one excited guest noted, It's everything. Like, it's Taco Bell in its whole fantasticness. Like, is that a word? I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> There was even a so called happier hour that included Taco Bell snacks and cocktails for guests who were 21 and older. There was also a Mountain Dew Baja Blast Freeze Lounge to chill out in, dive in movies in the pool, and plenty of Taco Bell items to choose from when you ordered room service. Belinda was right, heaven is a place on earth. There were only 70 rooms available at the resort. When Taco Bell opened up their reservations, they booked real fast. In fact, every room was reserved within two minutes. Basically, in the time it takes the average couch potato to wolf down a crunch wrap, the rooms were already sold. Here's hoping the chain revisits the idea one day, because every Taco Bell fanatic deserves a chance to experience the bell. But what to wear to such an event? These are wrappers for the Doritos Locos Tacos. When Taco Bell first introduced their now-famous Doritos Locos Tacos, they had no idea it would be such a hit. Mmm, I'm thinking about a neon orange meat-filled miracle taco wrapped in a nacho cheese Dorito shell. In the first 70 days following the product's launch, Taco Bell sold 100 million nacho cheese Doritos Locos Tacos. Clearly, all the testing and prototyping paid off. Not that it was always the easiest concept to wrap one's head around. So yeah, they're putting Doritos in the tacos. The hype was frankly hard to believe. So Allison, <laughs> can one delicious taco really save America? <laughs> I don't know if it's going to save America. I mean, what's the sodium content in that thing? Making the cheesy Doritos Loco shell took a lot of hard work. In fact, 40 different versions were tested before they settled on the final product. The Taco Bell food innovation team joined forces with Frito-Lay and came up with a simple idea that would change everything. Taco Bell wanted to make sure the shell had the signature cheesiness of a Dorito chip, but the taco shell needed to maintain its original texture, too. You see, the texture of a regular Doritos is too brittle and would break when stuffed with taco ingredients. Worker safety was another hurdle. Initially, blasting the taco shells with cheesy powder proved hazardous to employees. They'd inevitably inhale the stuff faster than you can inhale a Mexi Melt. That meant the company had to invent a totally new machine for seasoning the shells safely. It's beautiful. Well, all that hard work paid off. Over a billion Doritos Locos Tacos were sold during its first year on the menu. And they've since become a fast food legend. But times change, snacks change, advertising trends change. In 2018, the chain introduced nacho fries. And suddenly, Doritos Locos Tacos were no longer the most popular item on the menu. This kind of deliciousness doesn't just disappear. Where did you go? What if they were in a different space-time continuum? Another dimension? News outlets were quick to leap on the story. So it's basically just a french fry with a little bit of seasoning, and it comes with the nacho cheese sauce you can dip it in. There are currently 15 Taco Bell restaurants in Alaska, but it's a huge state. So if you don't live near one of those locations, good luck getting that chalupa. That's why residents of the small town of Bethel, Alaska, were heartbroken after falling for a hoax in 2012. Reportedly, some diabolical trickster put up flyers around town, advertising that a new Taco Bell was opening in the area. Local residents were beside themselves when they learned it was all a prank, until the real Taco Bell came to the rescue. Well, it's time somebody delivered some good news. Taco Bell CEO Greg Cree told CNBC, If we can feed people in Afghanistan and Iraq, we can feed people in Bethel. Taco Bell delivered hundreds of pounds of food by helicopter, enough for the town to come together and indulge in 10,000 Doritos Locos Tacos. It wasn't an emergency, but it was a rapid response team, sort of. In 1989, Taco Bell and Batman proved to be a match made in marketing heaven. The fast food chain ran a summer promotion that involved giving away free plastic Batman collector cups, and the event broke records for Taco Bell's promotional tie-ins. Right now, at Taco Bell, you can collect free Batman cups, like a free Batmobile cup. How did it work? Easy. Customers who ordered a large drink would get one of the cups, just like that. Where are you? He's Batman, and Taco Bell's got him. Thanks to the promotion, one store told the Los Angeles Times that sales were up at least 25%. Another location claimed they went from selling 600 large drinks a day to 1,000 large drinks a day. That's a whole lot of Mountain Dew. To drum up excitement, Taco Bell restaurants were decorated with massive cardboard cutouts of a certain brooding superhero. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the campaign inspired some ravenous Batman enthusiasts to steal those cutouts. One company spokesperson told the Los Angeles Times, We're hoping maybe Batman himself will show up at the stores to rescue himself from overzealous fans. 
Over the years, there have been plenty of rumors about Taco Bell's beef. Pretty sure you, you know what you're paying for when you come to Taco Bell. If you want real beef, you probably go somewhere else. In the past, skeptics have claimed Taco Bell beef is made with everything from mealworms to grade D beef. How brutal. C. D. F. 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 But spoiler alert, grade D beef doesn't even exist. But that simple fact didn't stop a few intense lawsuits from making headlines. The lawsuit claimed that the meat filling used by Taco Bell was less than 35% beef. While Taco Bell's beef does come pre-cooked and in bags, the truth isn't particularly scandalous. It's actually 88% beef, and the other ingredients rounding out the recipe are all rather common. Yes, they do use some fillers derived from oats, and the meat is blended with soy lecithin, which is used to make sure the ingredients in beef don't separate. But all told, the list of ingredients isn't particularly shocking. In recent years, Taco Bell has been focusing on sourcing more of its beef from sustainable suppliers. That is, suppliers that are working to reduce the amount of antibiotics in their supply of beef. Taco Bell is known for meaty items like the Chipotle Chicken Loaded Griller and the Beefy Crunch Burrito. And these tasty snacks have earned the fast food chain a fervent following. If a Taco Bell burns down, you better believe there's going to be a vigil. Locals mourning the loss of their beloved Taco Bell. Always remember Taco Bell's Zelda Road. We're just out here. You remember it. John, let's talk about what's going on. Like many fast food restaurants, the chain is looking to expand its fan base by offering an array of vegan and vegetarian options. Actually, Taco Bell has always been a pretty good option in that regard. You can sub out the meat in any menu item for beans, rice, or potatoes. And in 2019, Taco Bell made a corporate commitment to making its menu even more friendly to vegetarians and vegans. Right now, you can already choose 8 million vegetarian combinations at Taco Bell. As it says on the official website, that's enough to customize a new meal every day for nearly 20,000 years. The chain is also testing out its first official vegetarian menu. News that's really got people talking. The Taco Bell website even offers a handy guide to eating vegan at the restaurant that was created in partnership with the American Vegetarian Association. This guide will teach you how to make some of Taco Bell's classic menu items, dairy, and meat-free, including the Crunchwrap Supreme and the Soft Taco. Excitement about this new development is clearly contagious. Taco Bell has been offering vegetarian options since 2015, but this is the first time that the company will have the vegetarian menu highlighted in stores. Taco Bell was founded by entrepreneur Glenn Bell, whose first establishment sold hot dogs and hamburgers. That was Bell's Drive-In, which operated out of San Bernardino, California, beginning in 1948. Glenn eventually opened Taco Tia in 1954, where he sold hot dogs, hamburgers, and tacos. In fact, his chili dog recipe was the inspiration for Taco Bell's original taco sauce. He always had a passion for Mexican food. In a 1978 speech, Bell explained why he initially decided to operate out of San Bernardino. My plan for experimenting with tacos was to obtain a location in a Mexican neighborhood. That way, if tacos were successful, potential competitors would write it off to the location and assume that the idea wouldn't sell anywhere else. Bell eventually realized tacos should be his focus. He opened a restaurant called El Taco, later selling his shares and his Taco Tia locations, in order to open the first Taco Bell in 1962 in Downey, California. At the original Taco Bell, tacos and other Mexican-American favorites were the stars, and they sold for just 19 cents apiece. However, the restaurant kept serving burgers, in the form of chili burgers. The Bell Beefer was the last burger on the menu, and it was discontinued in the 90s. If you grew up thinking that all tacos came in a crunchy yellow shell that came out of an old El Paso kit, you aren't alone, but that version of the taco is a relatively new arrival on the scene. In fact, the crunchy preformed taco shell was actually invented by Taco Bell founder Glenn Bell in the early 60s. Bell was trying to figure out the best way to sell large amounts of tacos quickly, and that's when he came up with the preformed crunchy taco shell. These bad boys could be made ahead of time and kept at room temperature until needed. This was essential because Bell was trying to compete with McDonald's, another booming chain that was taking off in San Bernardino, California. Thanks to preformed taco shells, employees don't have to cook every single taco to order. They can just stuff the shell and sell. It's a brilliant business strategy, that is until employees start licking taco shells for kicks. So the employee in that picture is suspended and will be fired. It's gross. It definitely is not good, but it doesn't surprise me. I think maybe it should uh, help these uh, corporations reflect on who they're hiring. The original Taco Bell restaurant, or Taco Bell Numero Uno, as the company calls it, ceased operations in 1986. However, even though the building was no longer an official Taco Bell restaurant, it was rented out to other taquerias until 2014, when it was abandoned for good. The powers that be at Taco Bell ultimately decided they couldn't let this piece of history get torn down. So what do you do when you can't stay somewhere? You pack up and you hit the road. 
the building was lifted off its foundation and transported to the company headquarters in Irvine, California. It definitely took a long trek to get here. 47 miles this building drove overnight on a flatbed truck. The journey took place on November 19, 2015, and the petite 400-square-foot building made it safely through the streets of Los Angeles to arrive at its new home. The chain hasn't said what they plan to do with Taco Bell numero uno, but at least they preserved an important piece of fast food history. We'll be sure to update this news story as more information becomes available. Back to you, Jason. I used to walk across Grand River to the Taco Bell at Collingwood, and I would get two steak soft tacos and a Cholito, a.k.a. the chili cheese burrito. In a sea of fast food competitors, White Castle stands out. Perhaps it's the small size of its iconic sliders, the mystique of its busy late night hours, or scarcity in certain states. But the company has been successful creating a crave worthy business. Here's the untold truth of White Castle Making History. As strange as it sounds, America's entire fast food industry began with White Castle back in 1921. With just $700, Edgar Waldo Ingram and Walter Anderson opened a tiny burger shack in Wichita, Kansas. Yes, it looked like a little White Castle from the beginning, and the rest is history. Legend has it that's where Anderson invented the hamburger bun as well, changing burgers forever. Why did the slider go to the gym? I don't know. To get better buns! Get it? Buns? <laughs> Want in on the deal? That's too bad because the company likes to keep its fast food empire within the family and doesn't franchise. Why? It mostly comes down to keeping restaurant locations within close proximity to its supply facilities, and while that means they have far fewer locations than they could, it's all about quality. That refusal to franchise also comes with a weird footnote. Since moving their headquarters to Ohio in 1933 and closing their last Kansas location in 1938, there are no White Castles left in their home state. Health and Cleanliness White Castle was founded at a time the American public was dubious about the cleanliness and safety of many foods, and that's why the founders decided to make their restaurant white. They wanted a look that gave the place a sense of cleanliness, and it worked. Employees working behind the counter were also held to strict standards. Old White Castle employee checklists show that they were told to be clean-shaven and were warned about bad body odor and bad breath, and needed to have their hair neatly combed and tucked under their hat. This level of cleanliness has continued, and White Castle was one of the first fast food chains to show transparency by displaying restaurant health scores online. Cleanliness and safety go hand in hand, and White Castle also went to extreme lengths to disprove the early 20th century idea that burgers were super dangerous. One University of Minnesota med student risked everything to eat 13 weeks of burgers for a joint study. When he came out the other side absolutely fine, White Castle used his study to prove burgers weren't deadly after all. Changing for the best The price isn't the only thing that's changed since 1921, and over the years, the cooking process changed too. While burgers were once cooked by placing small balls of meat on the grill and squishing them, that's not the case today. Now, frozen beef patties are cooked on a griddle over a bed of onions and water, and they cook super fast thanks to the small holes punched in them. That last part was a suggestion made by employee Earl Howell in 1954, and it allows for a faster cook with no need to flip. Fast service at a good price is popular with all customers, but you might not expect vegans to be waiting in line at White Castle. They absolutely are, though, because this burger joint has been involved in one of the biggest recent vegan successes in fast food. White Castle began working on a plant-based patty with Impossible Foods back in 2017, and the Impossible Slider began popping up on White Castle menus at 140 locations in New York, New Jersey, and Chicago before going nationwide, becoming an instant hit. It's a hot date spot. White Castle has been marketing itself as a Valentine's Day destination for several years now, and it's been a major success. A whopping 35,000 reservations were expected for Valentine's Day festivities at participating restaurants in 2015. In addition to waiter service, decorations, and roses, the company even rolled out new menu items like bite-sized shrimp nibblers. Celebrating the love between you and your significant other at White Castle obviously isn't for everybody, but for couples with a sense of humor looking to keep it casual, the idea has been a big hit. The romance is so real, they've even hosted a wedding, and the happy couple tied the knot at an Indianapolis location in 2012. Hall of Fame For those who have truly taken their love of burgers to the next level, the White Castle Cravers Hall of Fame awaits. Getting in isn't easy, and of the thousands who apply, just a handful are accepted. 
Anybody who feels they have a really good White Castle story or can prove their undying devotion is invited to apply, but their panel of judges only selects around a dozen applicants each year. Among some of the more famous names who can claim membership are the creators and actors of Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle and rocker Alice Cooper, who has loved the burgers since his childhood. We're on this side of the Mississippi. If we pass a White Castle, we stop. So, you know, this will go on the bus. Harold and Kumar. White Castle had their time in the Hollywood spotlight with the 2004 movie Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle, but it almost didn't happen. Screenwriters initially had the two friends searching for a Krispy Kreme location to satisfy their munchies, but when the donut chain backed out of the idea, a fictional hot dog stand was written in. Finally, they got in touch with White Castle executives, who loved the idea. Jamie Richardson, who was White Castle's director of marketing at the time, said, It was like a love letter to White Castle. There's some truth to the fiction, too. According to Foursquare, an impressive 21.5% of the chain's business happens between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Who would have thought? It's tough to imagine a world without Burger King. For over 60 years, the company has provided cheap and filling food to hundreds of millions of customers across the globe. Here are a few things you probably don't know or don't remember about this American favorite. Break out the burners, because we grilling this dog my way. Bikinis, martinis, zucchinis, yeah, you know the rest. The Whopper Sacrifice in 2009, Burger King created a one-off app which awarded users a coupon for a free Whopper if they deleted 10 people from their friends list. Oh, and the app also sent a message to the friends you deleted, informing them that you valued their friendship at less than one-tenth of a Whopper from Burger King. Facebook shut the app down after only 10 days, claiming it was a massive violation of their users' privacy. In that time, however, the app had already been installed on almost 60,000 accounts. 20,000 of those got their free Whoppers, while 200,000 more people were force-fed a hefty dose of reality. Burger King vs. Burger King In 1952, Jean and Betty Hoots bought the Frigid Queen ice cream store in Mattoon, Illinois. They quickly added burgers and fries to the menu and changed its name to Burger King. They even acquired a state trademark for the name in 1959. A few years later, the real Burger King rolled into town. It was a classic case of David vs. Goliath, and in this case, the little guy won. The larger Burger King chain was forbidden from opening a location anywhere inside a 20-mile radius of the Hoots' Burger King. Although the company later offered the Hoots $10,000 to set up shop within the radius, their offer was firmly declined. The restaurant still exists to this day. The Google Ad in 2017, Burger King introduced an ad campaign specifically designed to hijack the devices in viewers' homes. The commercial was basic enough. An actor facing the screen asks, Okay, Google, what is the Whopper Burger? Any Google Home device that picked up the audio would then react by reading aloud the Wikipedia entry for the Whopper. Google didn't appreciate the gimmick. The ad was only effective for about three hours after it aired, when the audio was added to a list of sounds that Google Home would refuse to respond to. Easy come, easy go. The BK Sauna Burger King made headlines in 2016 when they opened their very own sauna. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it's located in Helsinki, the capital of a country populated by 5 million people and 2 million saunas. But only in this one can you relax, make your order, and chow down on a Whopper and some fries. While sweating like crazy, of course, there's enough room inside for around 15 people, making it perfect for private parties. And guests can even purchase robes embroidered with the BK logo. The Burger King sauna has been something of a surprise hit since it opened. And no wonder, where else can you go to get literal meat sweats. How's the burger? <laughs> you, you know, right? Probably not supposed to do this, right? Can you Let's see what happens. The net neutrality debate. Net neutrality has been a landmark political issue for several years now. As the threat to net neutrality has increased, no small number of celebrities and companies have entered the fray to explain just how devastating it would be if internet providers were allowed to charge more for higher speeds and priority service. In 2018, Burger King broadcast a series of commercials in which customers were asked whether they wanted to pay more for their Whopper to get it faster. The customers paid different amounts based on each Whopper's making burgers per second speed, whilst employees explained that, since the restaurant could make more selling chicken sandwiches, they had decided to restrict access speeds to the Whopper alone. We don't make the rules. You just enforce these ridiculous rules? Fortunately, we have to. Burger King then directed viewers to a petition aimed at preserving net neutrality. It was a brilliant way to make a realistic comparison between burgers and the potential pitfalls of an unbalanced internet. The Whopper actually told me about net neutrality. It's stupid, but true. Crown Cards 
In 2008, actor and comedian Hugh Laurie sent shockwaves across the world by revealing to the Times that certain celebrities had been gifted their very own Lifetime Unlimited Burger King crown cards. He also named a number of well-known figures, including Jay Leno and George Lucas, as recipients of the card. Laurie didn't actually have his own card at the time, but was granted one soon after he made his comments to the press, making him the 12th celebrity to receive an unlimited crown card. The Bling Burger in 2008, Burger King created what they simply called the Burger. Available in just one restaurant in West London, the burger was made with Wagyu beef, Pate Negra ham, Cristal onion straws, white truffles, and Modena balsamic vinegar. Anyone wanting to sample this decadent beast would first have to fork over 95 euro, or around $125. It was all for a good cause, though. 100% of the proceeds from sales of the burger were donated to the Help a London Child Charity, an organization which lends a helping hand to children and young people suffering from homelessness, poverty, illness, and abuse. A Secret Meal Burger King's most famous secret menu item is the Quad Stacker. It consists of four patties, four slices of cheese, a layer of bacon, and special sauce. And if that doesn't exactly sound like the healthiest choice on the menu, that's because it's not. No official nutritional information exists for the Quad Stacker, but the Triple Stacker will set you back 640 calories, 42 grams of fat, and 940 milligrams of sodium. Throw in fries and a drink, and you've got yourself a disaster just waiting to happen. Maybe stick to the salad next time. Wendy's has more than 6,500 locations across the globe, making it the third largest burger franchise in the world. Founded in 1969, today the company is worth billions and has become beloved by people all over the world who love their burgers and fries. But there are a few little-known facts about the chain that may surprise you. Frosty Origins there are plenty of classic menu items to choose from at Wendy's, like the tried-and-true Frosty. But did you know this creamy favorite has been around since Wendy's was first founded in 1969? According to the official Wendy's website, founder Dave Thomas wanted a dessert so thick you had to eat it with a spoon. And so the Frosty, conceived as a cross between a milkshake and soft-serve ice cream, was born. To keep the chocolate flavor from being too overwhelming, Thomas added vanilla to the recipe. The result was a sweet chocolate treat that perfectly complemented a hamburger. While this chocolate-vanilla combo was the default Frosty flavor for decades, the Vanilla Frosty launched in 2006. Unexpected Success When Wendy's was launched in 1969, there were just five items on the menu. Thomas didn't have great ambitions for the first restaurant he opened in Columbus, Ohio. He simply wanted a small local chain where his kids could work in the summer. Despite his modest expectations, Thomas soon found himself with a successful business. He opened a second Wendy's after a year, and by 1974, sales totaled at nearly $25 million. By the end of 1976, not even a decade since the company was started, there were 500 Wendy's locations. Gee, this is pretty good. Famous Face Dave Thomas had four kids and knew one of them would become the face of the restaurant. But he wasn't playing favorites when he picked eight-year-old Melinda, nicknamed Wendy. She told People in 1990, Dad wanted a name that was easy to remember, and he wanted an all-American mug. I was redheaded and had freckles and buck teeth, so I got elected." Wendy admitted to often being embarrassed because of her famous face. There was always teasing, it just goes with the territory. Dropout to Entrepreneur The success of Wendy's is even more impressive when you look at the history of Dave Thomas. A high school dropout, Thomas served in the Korean War before becoming a cook. He went on to work at Kentucky Fried Chicken, where he came up with the idea for the KFC Chicken Bucket. After climbing through the ranks, Thomas left the company in 1969 and founded Wendy's. The rest is history. After Wendy's became a success, a 61-year-old Thomas went back to school to earn his GED. He then founded the Dave Thomas Education Center to help other high school dropouts earn their GEDs as well. Value Pioneer Value menus have been standard at fast food restaurants for decades, but Wendy's was the first, launching the first value menu in 1989, nearly a decade before Burger King got on the value menu train in 1998. Denny Lynch, the senior VP of communications for Wendy's, explained why the company decided to offer menu items at a discounted price. At that time, all of the hamburger chains were going after each other, and it escalated to the point where we were seeing 99-cent Whoppers and Big Macs. We had the idea of rather than selling one of our big items at 99 cents, creating a whole menu with 99-cent items. We wanted our customers to be able to make a full meal with these lower-priced items. Hip to be square Wendy's is noted for the unusual shape of its hamburger patties. There's a good reason the patties are square instead of round. Thomas got the idea for the square patties from a Michigan restaurant called Cupy Burger, which serves square-shaped patties. Thomas decided to incorporate these patties so customers could easily see the freshness of the meat. The corners of the square patty stick out past the circular bun, making it easy to see just how juicy the burger really is. Beef Lady Beef Wendy's launched a series of memorable commercials in 1984, 
featuring a catchphrase that became world famous. Where's the beef? The commercials were so successful that Wendy's became synonymous with the phrase, and the actress delivering it, Clara Peller. But Peller was fired in 1985 for starring in a Prego spaghetti sauce commercial. In the commercial, Peller announced that she had finally found the beef, angering Wendy's. A spokesperson for the chain said, The commercial infers that Clara found the beef at somewhere other than Wendy's restaurants. Unfortunately, Clara's appearance in the ads makes it extremely difficult for her to serve as a credible spokesperson for our products. In 2017, Restaurant Brands International, which also owns Tim Hortons and Burger King, added Popeyes to their roster. And the announcement sent social media into a tailspin, with everyone wondering whether or not their beloved chicken was changing forever. But how much do fans really know about Popeye's chicken? Turns out there's more to this chain than a whole lot of Louisiana lovin'. Here's the untold truth of Popeye's. Did you eat all of my samples? Mom? Yes, you did. Okay, not that Popeye. The name Popeye might conjure up images of spinach-fueled cartoon muscles, but that's not the guy the chain was named after. In 1972, the restaurant got its name from Detective Jimmy Popeye Doyle in The French Connection. All right, Popeye's here! Get your hands on your heads! Get off the bar and get on the wall! But that wasn't the restaurant's original name, either. Alvin C. Copeland Sr. opened the first location under the name Chicken on the Run. A few months later, after replacing his traditional chicken with a spicy version, he reopened as Popeye's. Buying back the recipes Many big-name brands have signature recipes, but Popeyes didn't actually own their secret chicken recipes until 2014. When Copeland passed away in 2008, Slate reported those proprietary Popeyes recipes became part of his estate, with Popeyes forking over $3.1 million a year in royalties. It wasn't until 2014 that the company paid Copeland's estate a whopping $43 million for full rights to the recipes. The thing about those chickens. According to Popeyes, the restaurant only sources chickens from suppliers who abide by guidelines established by the National Chicken Council. But not everyone is happy with Popeyes' procedures. In 2018, animal welfare group Compassion in World Farming claimed that Popeyes hadn't been sourcing chickens cruelty-free. The group said they wanted Popeyes to switch to sourcing only chickens raised in healthy, comfortable situations, a promise they said Popeyes refused to make. An online petition has garnered over 150,000 signatures, but Popeyes has yet to respond to the protest. An anti-antibiotic pledge Watt Agnet reported in 2016 that some fast food chains had pledged to phase out meat from suppliers that used antibiotics as a growth promoter. And among the first to step up to the plate were Chick-fil-A, Papa John's Pizza, and Panera Bread. Not making the list? Popeyes. It wasn't until mid-2017 that Popeyes pledged to be antibiotic-free by 2018. But as of September 2017, according to the Natural Resources Defense Council, Popeyes shareholders were still in the process of petitioning the company to make good on their promise. You're suing for what? In November 2016, Mississippi attorney Paul Newton Jr. sued Popeyes after allegedly choking on a piece of chicken because it didn't come with a plastic knife. According to Fortune, Newton said he even had to undergo emergency surgery to remove a piece of chicken from his throat. But the Huffington Post reported he dropped the suit because of extreme comments on social media, like whether he had ever eaten chicken or anything before in his life. Then in 2017, a Texas woman filed a lawsuit claiming Popeye's food had poisoned her with flesh-eating worms. Karen Good wanted $1 million in damages, but according to the Washington Post, Gwen Pearson of Purdue's entomology department said of the claim, nothing about this, biologically, is sound. That secret spice. Ask any diehard fan what makes Popeye so good, and they'll probably say it's that spicy kick in the seasoning. Todd Wilbur of Top Secret Recipes Unlocked says he's hacked the mystery ingredients of the Cajun Sparkle Seasoning Mix and claims it's all about that MSG. Oh, and salt, black pepper, onion powder, dried sage, paprika, and cayenne pepper. But to really nail that signature blend, just go straight to the source. Olive Garden may not be the most authentic Italian restaurant out there, but we love it nonetheless. On the surface, Olive Garden may seem pretty straightforward, but they have an interesting past. It's time to discover these interesting facts you never knew about Olive Garden. Breakfast Connection you may not think of breakfast when you think of Olive Garden, but there's an interesting connection there. Specifically, the connection between Olive Garden and breakfast cereal giant General Mills. But this isn't about Lucky Charms and Cheerios. General Mills is also responsible for the creation of Olive Garden. Back in 1970, General Mills entered into the restaurant industry when they bought Red Lobster. 
As Red Lobster became a success, General Mills decided to expand upon their restaurant endeavors and open up Olive Garden. Although Olive Garden became a thriving business, General Mills eventually decided to get out of the restaurant industry. In 1995, Olive Garden and the other restaurants owned by General Mills were spun off into a new independent company owned by stockholders called Darden Restaurants, Inc. Big Goals Some restaurants start out as small, independently-run businesses that naturally turn into chain restaurants over time. That wasn't the case for Olive Garden. When General Mills started the restaurant, it was with the intentions of turning it into a chain. The first Olive Garden opened its doors in 1982 in Orlando, Florida, and by 1989, Olive Garden had already opened up 145 locations. With over 100 location openings in less than 10 years, Olive Garden's business was thriving, turning it into a popular dining staple among Americans. Whether it's the comforting all-you-can-eat salad and breadsticks or the familiarity of the dining experience, business is apparently still thriving for Olive Garden, with over 800 locations throughout North America. Skipping the salt The first rule most people are taught when cooking pasta is that you have to salt the water. By adding a pinch of salt, the pasta is able to soak it up during the cooking process, which enhances the overall flavor. This is a fundamental step that is looked down upon when skipped, and Olive Garden found that out the hard way. They faced some serious backlash when shareholder Starboard Value called them out on skipping the crucial ingredient, which was one of many complaints during a 300-slide presentation. So what was Olive Garden's reasoning for not salting? The pots. Apparently, the company claimed that adding salt would ruin the warranty on their pots. Putting that to the test, Huffington Post conducted their own experiment to see if this was true. According to their experiment, if you add salt to the water when it's boiling, it can't react to the oxygen in the water, thus saving the pot. Sounds like Olive Garden could use a little cooking advice here or there. All those breadsticks With unlimited breadsticks as an option, do you ever wonder just how many breadsticks Olive Garden serves in a year? In 2014, they served about 675 million. That may sound like an astounding amount of bread, but that equals out to about three breadsticks per customer per visit. I love bread. While the customers may absolutely love them, not everyone in the company is happy about the number of breadsticks being served. Starboard Value, the same investor that was unhappy about the lack of salt in the pasta water, felt that serving a whopping 675 million free breadsticks is too much. They were also not pleased with the quality of the breadsticks themselves, stating that after seven minutes, the breadsticks went stale which resulted in massive quantities of food waste. While they recommended serving one breadstick per customer, the unlimited breadsticks are still being offered, for now. Sofa what? Were you a fan of Olive Garden's pastacchetti? What about their sofatelli? While these may sound like delicious, authentic Italian dishes, Olive Garden made them up. While the chefs responsible for these creations may or may not have taken inspiration from Italy, you won't find these dishes anywhere but Olive Garden. Unfortunately for Olive Garden, customers weren't fans of the unfamiliar dishes featuring gourmet-sounding ingredients. In fact, the lack of consumer interest in the menu items was partly to blame for two quarters of disappointing sales. Due to the failure of these menu items, Olive Garden decided to get back to the basics with traditional Italian dishes and promote actual Italian food with familiar names their customers would recognize. Don't mess with a good thing. Their Culinary Institute The Olive Garden Culinary Institute of Tuscany does in fact exist in Italy, but it's not what its name makes it out to be. What they suggest is a type of cooking academy where Olive Garden chefs are trained is more along the lines of a retreat for managers. An anonymous Reddit poster who claimed she attended the institute as an employee explained that it is nothing more than a hotel that Olive Garden reserves for managers and chefs during the off-season. While Olive Garden employees do have access to the hotel's kitchen if they choose to utilize it, there is no school there. Most employees spend the entire time sightseeing rather than training. The Redditor wrote, The only time we saw the chef was when she made a bolognese sauce while taking pictures with each of us to send to our local newspapers. Millennials love it. Millennials may take the blame for killing the chain restaurant industry, but one chain restaurant they aren't killing is Olive Garden. Along with avocado toast and rosé wine, millennials apparently really love Olive Garden. According to Food & Wine, Olive Garden sales have soared while other restaurant chains are taking a big hit, and part of that is due to their faithful millennial clientele. About 30% of their patrons are millennials. So while competing chain restaurants like Applebee's, Buffalo Wild Wings, and TGI Fridays are seeing sales plummet, Olive Garden's business continues to thrive. Olive Garden, really? I've, I gotta be, I've never been to the Olive Garden. Oh, man. So what is it about Olive Garden that attracts millennials? Perhaps it's the beloved chicken Alfredo or the unlimited salad and breadsticks. Whatever it is, millennials love it. And that is good news for Olive Garden. 
With over 2,000 locations across North America, Panera Bread has carved out a special place in the dining landscape thanks to free Wi-Fi, healthy options, and food that's fast without being fast food. But how much do you really know about your favorite sandwich shop? Here's a look at the untold truth of Panera Bread. Obon Pan If Panera Bread feels like a modern, upscale version of the old bakery chain Obon Pan, there's a good reason for that. The St. Louis Bread Company was founded in 1987. In 1993, though, the burgeoning chain was purchased by Obon Pan and renamed Panera. Six years later, they decided to expand outside of the St. Louis area and go national. Just how sure was Obon Pan that Panera was the future of bakery cafes? The company actually sold off Obon Pan itself in order to focus exclusively on Panera instead. Their secret weapon wasn't even bread, though. As one of the first chains to offer free internet, at one point Panera actually became America's largest provider of free Wi-Fi, helping turn the regional brand into a national sensation overnight. Certified Fresh Though the dough used at Panera Bread is prepared off-site and then shipped to individual locations, the bread and pastries you get at Panera are in fact baked on-site each and every day to ensure freshness. Not everything you get at Panera is done that way, though. According to a Reddit AMA by an alleged Panera employee, their mac and cheese is sent to store frozen and then reheated, while some fruits like avocados are supposedly left out all day and thus may not be so fresh by the time you get to them. They're pretty healthy. In 2013, Panera was named the healthiest fast food chain by Health Magazine. They were the first chain in the industry to post calorie counts in their menus and were praised by dietitians for their variety of healthy options, such as whole grain breads and fresh fruit. Additionally, the half-size option makes it easy to exercise portion control when ordering soups, salads, and sandwiches. They were also credited with having healthy options for kids, including organic peanut butter and yogurt. But they aren't stopping there. The company announced in 2017 that everything on the menu will be available in child-sized portions, making it easier for kids to have a variety of healthy options while challenging other chains to follow suit. Clean eating? Panera boasts that all the food they serve is clean, which according to the company, describes food that has no artificial flavors, preservative sweeteners, and no colors from artificial sources. That sounds good, but some experts have criticized Panera's clean campaign as fear-mongering. Matt Teagarden, a graduate fellow in food science at Ohio State University, told Forbes, it promotes the perception that scientific-sounding food additives are harmful, unhealthy substances that do not belong in foods. Their scientific names, admittedly, may not sound super apt Advertising, but in no way does that mean they're unsafe. Go small. Finally, if you're sitting down for a meal at Panera, here's a money-saving tip. You don't need to order a large fountain drink or coffee, because aside from smoothies, lemonade, ice cream tea, hot chocolate, and made-to-order espresso drinks, all beverages come with free refills. Free refills and free Wi-Fi? No wonder Panera is so popular. Chances are, if you've heard of Firehouse Subs, you're a loyal fan. What started as a simple sandwich shop in Florida has expanded to just over 1,100 stores around the nation. And while it's not yet as well known as Subway, in 2017, Firehouse Subs was voted the most popular sandwich shop in the country. So why do people love it so much? Here's a look at some things you didn't know about Firehouse Subs. The Anti-Subway Called the anti-subway by Business Insider, Firehouse Subs doesn't bother trying to position itself as a healthy alternative to fast food. Instead, they focus on taste, piling their hefty sandwiches high with meats, cheese, and homemade sauces to satisfy customers with big appetites. How committed to meat is Firehouse Subs? When they finally began offering healthier options in 2014, rather than add veggies, they instead just began offering sandwiches with low-fat dressing and less bread. The founders boasted that even the under 500 calories sandwich menu has the exact same amount of meat as its more indulgent counterparts. Rags to Riches According to CNBC, founders Chris and Robin Sorensen only had $100 to their names when they first opened Firehouse Subs in Jacksonville, Florida in 1994. But the brothers, who come from a family of firefighters, believe that being broke led to the eventual success of their national sandwich chain. Robin told CNBC, Even though I didn't understand it at the time, being broke forced us to be patient, and that patience really turned out to be a service. We were able to learn a lot more about the business and grow at the right pace. Hurricane Katrina 
After Hurricane Katrina devastated the Gulf Coast in 2005, the Sorensen brothers donated time and equipment to help first responders in Mississippi. That led to a company-wide commitment to public service through the Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation, which has raised more than $33 million to help benefit first responders in 43 states and Puerto Rico, providing financial assistance and donating modern equipment to firehouses around the nation. The Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation, in my opinion, is the, is the best thing we've ever done. And the Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation is particularly busy during the holidays, providing free meals to first responders. Jim Sherman, who owns Firehouse franchises in Alabama, told Small Business Trends that the idea came from his daughter. I used to be in the Coast Guard and had duty on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Luckily, most of the time we had a galley that would feed us, but in a couple places we didn't have that. So bringing food to those people during the holidays is something that's near and dear to me. The Unique Murals whether or not you're a fan of the elaborate firefighter-themed murals found on the inside of every Firehouse Subs location, they don't just exist to go with the first responder theme. Every mural in each of the Firehouse Subs locations is a unique tribute to the firehouse in the local community. Local fire departments get a say in what the mural looks like, and some even donate old photos and equipment to the restaurant to really spruce up the place. Surprisingly, every single mural in each of the Firehouse Subs restaurants has been created by the same artist, Joe Puskas. Puskas started each custom a mural as a pencil sketch, and then he and his team paint them. They always feature a fire truck that's unique to that particular city or town, as well as some personalized details like the town's fire dog. According to Food Beast, the whole process can take up to 70 hours to complete. Level 55 Anyone who has been to a Firehouse Subs restaurant knows that it's a haven for hot sauce junkies. When you order a sandwich, you can top it with any number of hot sauces ranked from 1 to 10, or barely there, to melt your face off. After Firehouse Subs got wind of hot sauce challenges posted to YouTube in 2015, they posted their own video of their ultimate Level 55 Hot Sauce Challenge, where they challenged customers to try each of the levels of hot sauce from 1 to 10 on their sandwich. This adds up to, you guessed it, 55. This challenge seems like it's more about pushing your limits and actually enjoying a sandwich, because who would want to dump 10 different types of sauce on their food? Don't hold the mayo. When you order a Firehouse sub, you're going to get a generous helping of mayonnaise, because the Sorensen brothers believe that mayo is the glue that holds their sandwiches together. Robin told Thrillist, in the South, we put mayonnaise on everything, so it wasn't anything we even discussed. You put mayonnaise on a sandwich. The mayonnaise used on the sandwiches is in fact Duke's mayonnaise, which any Southerner would immediately recognize as the favorite spread of Dixieland. But that isn't the only hand-picked ingredient in a Firehouse sub. Chris and Robin personally chose every part of the sandwich, which is why the pickles are from Katz's Deli in New York City, the bread is sourced from a French bakery in Atlanta, and the 16-hour smoked brisket comes from Sadler's Smokehouse in Texas. Homemade Hook and Ladder if you don't have a Firehouse sub nearby, don't worry, because you can make their signature hook and ladder sandwich yourself thanks to this copycat recipe from Genius Kitchen. Sure, it may not have all those fancy ingredients from around the world, but all you need is smoked turkey breast, honey-glazed ham, and melted Monterey Jack cheese, along with mayo, mustard, hot sauce, onions, and, of course, a toasted roll. Our mouths are watering just thinking about it. Little Caesars has built an empire on having pizza ready on demand, becoming America's premier pizza pickup chain. But how much do you know about them? Here's a look at the untold truth of Little Caesars. Little Caesars was founded by Mike and Marion Illich in Garden City, Michigan. It was a huge risk, as the couple spent their entire life savings opening the doors to their pizza place on May 8, 1959. Luckily, it paid off, and in a big way. The first day, they sold 49 pizzas, along with other non-standard options like fish, hot dogs, and chicken. Within three years, Little Caesars had already been franchised. As a franchise owner, you'll find out firsthand how much fun you can have being your own boss. By 1982, the chain was big enough that the couple was able to buy the Detroit Red Wings. And in 1992, they bought the Detroit Tigers. Not bad for a little mom-and-pop organization. The Little Caesars empire doesn't just include sports teams, though. It also boasts a mushroom farm? What the f*** does that have to do with pizza? Okay, here's the deal. In 1969, Little Caesars opened its 50th location, and by 1971, they were looking for ways to make sure their restaurants were getting quality ingredients. The solution? Little Caesars Mushroom Farms, Inc., which allowed them to grow, package, and distribute mushrooms to all their locations without using an outside vendor. It worked so well, additional products were added, and it gradually became Blue Line Food Service, providing fresh food to companies in the U.S. and Canada. 
Pizza and delivery seem to go hand in hand, but after flirting with delivery a few years ago, Little Caesars decided to stick to pickup only. And CEO David Scrivano told CNBC in 2017 that isn't going to change anytime soon, citing customer convenience. Our customers know that it is exceptionally fast to pick up a pizza at Little Caesars, versus waiting 35 to 45 minutes or an hour for delivery. There's more to it, though, with money being the bottom line, of course. Delivery fees would raise the price of the pizza, and Little Caesars has prided themselves on remaining super affordable, with much of their customer base in economically disadvantaged areas. How dedicated are they to the idea of pickup only? In 2017, they introduced the Pizza Portal, which allows customers to order online and pick up their pizzas from an automated station without ever having to see an actual human being. Seems a little weird, but when it comes to fresh pizza, there are no rules. No calling? No waiting? There's no rules! Put your shirt back on! There's one rule! Since 1985, Little Caesars has given back to the community with their mobile love kitchen, which is a pizza shop on wheels that they deploy to areas in need during national emergencies. In 2014, they announced they were adding a second mobile kitchen to their fleet, which had already handed out more than 3 million meals to families who were homeless or displaced. That's just part of the legacy of the chain's late founder Mike Illich. When he passed away in 2017, it was revealed that besides giving millions to local charities, funding college scholarships, youth sports leagues and giving free sponsorship to Detroit's ailing industries, he had also secretly paid the rent for civil rights champion Rosa Parks for 11 years, from 1994 until her death in 2005. One of the most economically ravaged cities in America is Detroit, which has been in serious decline for years. But Little Caesars is doing everything it can to save the city, pouring an estimated $1.2 billion into the construction of the Little Caesars Arena and the surrounding entertainment district. And so far, it's paying off. Known as the Pizza Arena, Little Caesars Arena was named Sports Facility of the Year at the Sports Business Awards. Not everyone in Detroit is happy with Little Caesars, though, and in 2017, they were sued over pizza that was labeled halal, meaning it was prepared according to Islamic law. According to Dearborn's Mohamed Bazi, the pizza was labeled halal but wasn't, and it was only after he'd eaten some of the regular pepperoni that he realized he'd eaten pork. He sued Little Caesars for $100 million in damages. Little Caesars claimed that Bazi changed his order from a halal pizza to a hot and ready pizza that isn't labeled halal, and therefore the chain wasn't responsible if he ate it. In the end, the judge sided with the pizza chain and dismissed the lawsuit. Finally, from the land of internet rumors comes the claim that using the phrase pizza pizza while placing an order could sometimes get you a free order of crazy bread. Long ago, this used to be the case, but according to one Redditor, the practice is still in place in some locations. So does your local Little Caesars honor the secret pizza pledge? There's only one way to find out. Just let us know if it works, because some crazy bread right about now sure sounds yummy. People can eat their pizza-loving hearts out at CeCe's. Even the pizza biz, though, doesn't come without its share of gossip. CeCe's has seen some ups and downs since its inception. Keep watching to get the straight sauce on the untold truth of CeCe's. CeCe's is synonymous with pizza, and for good reason. Until 2015, the brand was called CeCe's Pizza. Not only did they drop the pizza part from their name, they also dumped the apostrophe, causing mass confusion over just whose restaurant chain this is anymore. But there was a reason behind the madness. By changing from CeCe's Pizza to simply CeCe's, the chain hoped to emphasize that they have a lot more to offer than a slice of pie. They also offer salads, soups, pastas, wings, desserts, and even a game room. And they don't want you to forget that, which might be why their new slogan is Beyond Pizza. Sarah McAloon, CeCe's chief marketing officer, said in a press release, CeCe's believes that differences are what make life most flavorful, so the new brand positioning underscores our promise to empower individuals through the freedom of the buffet to find the tastes they love. Along with the new name, CeCe's also unveiled a new abstract logo, which is comprised of different colored triangles coming together to form something that looks… kinda like a pizza? And in 2016, they completed the rebranding with redesigned restaurants, including a new color palette to match their logo, new seating, and an upgraded layout and buffet design that makes everything from the food to the games more accessible. Though the name of the chain is CeCe's, the restaurant was actually founded by a guy named Joe Croce, who opened the first location back in 1985. While other major pizza chain owners went on to become minor celebrities, like Little Caesars founder Mike Illich and Papa John Shatner, Croce was a different sort of owner. Franchise owner George Brown told Pizza Marketplace that Croce put people first and profit second, even lending money out of his own pocket to help people he believed in get a start with the chain. 
That man loaned me, a married father of four making $35,000 a year, $146,000. It was a handshake deal. In 2003, Croce announced in a press release that he had decided to sell CCs and retire at the age of 44 in order to focus on his family. I will be leaving CCs to become a full-time husband and father to my young family. In keeping with his philosophy, though, he insisted that the chain would only be sold to the people he trusted most, the other members of his executive board. And he also donated 20% of the profit from the sale of the chain to his local church in Texas. Talk about walking the walk. To think that if Joe Croce followed his degree and not his passion, it's possible the entire concept of the pizza buffet may not exist. Croce graduated college with an accounting degree, but after jumping into a job as an accountant, he realized his real passion was pizza. At the time, pizza places were either carry-out or delivery, and though Joe loved how pizza brought joy to people's lives, he felt that with the current pizza model, something was missing. So he created a sit-down pizza joint with an unlimited pizza buffet. It wasn't until the 90s that Pizza Hut followed suit with their own pizza buffet, but unlike CeCe's, their version was only available on weekends or as part of the lunch menu. Thanks, CeCe's! With more than a dozen varieties of pizza on the buffet at CeCe's, it's hard not to find something to love, but CeCe's custom ordering program makes sure there is truly a pizza for everyone. Guests looking to bite into their favorite pizza combination can rest assured that if they can't find it on the buffet, CeCe's will make it for them, in a personal size meant just for them. Pizza lovers can choose a traditional or flatbread option, add their choice of sauce, and pick up to four toppings to add to their personal pizza for no extra cost to the buffet price. And the personal pizza is still part of CeCe's famous buffet, so guests can still enjoy unlimited salad, dessert, and more pizza. Don't get too excited, though, because the unlimited pizza is actually limited to just one customizable pizza per customer. If you want seconds, you'll have to choose from choices already on the buffet. That's not the only limit on unlimited buffets. Multiple people online have claimed they were told they had exceeded the maximum amount of pizza allowed by the chain. A Redditor, for instance, posted that they were asked to leave after downing 22 slices, while another patron revealed on the IGN forums that they were shut off after an incredible 52 slices. So next time you're tempted to test just how unlimited the unlimited buffet is, now you know that even CeCe's has its limits. There's also one other thing about the buffet you should probably know. That food might not be nearly as fresh as you expect. Oh sure, CeCe says that their buffet is a place you'll find pizza hot and fresh right out of the oven, but the truth is that some of their locations haven't been up to par, leading to health code violations. We're here because you guys are on Dirty Dining this week for when you were shut down for the rat infestation. You're for instance, in Lincoln, Nebraska, a CeCe's was cited for 13 different violations. Some of those violations included too low of temperatures and items sitting out on the buffet for far longer than customers probably care to know. At another location, this time in Georgia, a CeCe's was cited during a health inspection for not noting the times they were placing pizzas out on the buffet. This location, too, was cited for temperatures being too low, specifically for the pizza sauce. The funny thing about the timing of the inspections is that both restaurant violations came after CeCe's was said to have implemented electronic timers on the buffet line. These timers are supposed to flash yellow, indicating when it's time to remove the pizza from the buffet and replace with a fresh one, leaving no excuse for a violation. Although all CeCe's restaurants are individually owned, it's hard not to judge all by the actions of some, so you may want to take a good long look at the items on the buffet next time you're filling up your plate, or ask an employee how long they've been there. CeCe's has been recognized as a kid-friendly restaurant, and it's not just because it has an array of different food options for picky eaters. CeCe's also prepares for those who need the food and entertainment combo on a family night out, or a place for kids to escape while parents enjoy some adult time. That's why CeCe's has a game room. From air hockey to arcade games, and even a few where you can win some prizes, CeCe's is making their restaurants more than a place to eat, but also to have a little fun. Before you find your lips and fingers stained with pizza sauce, grab some tokens and play some arcade games. Then, after your dessert of cinnamon rolls, play a little air hockey to round out the night. Some CeCe's locations even have a few coin-operated toys to ride, for little ones not quite ready to bring their A-game to the arcade. In 2016, CeCe's fell victim to a data breach that affected at least 135 restaurants across the country. 
hackers had tricked employees into installing card-stealing software at the affected stores, and when customers were swiping credit cards at the register, data was captured. The number of credit cards affected during the breach were upwards of 600,000. How does a hacker trick someone into causing such mass chaos? According to experts, the hackers actually used social pressure rather than anything super high-tech. They just called the locations and conned the employees into installing the malware themselves. CC's is not the only chain to fall victim to a malware attack like this, though. 41 million customers were affected due to a Target data breach. After Target, Home Depot fell victim to the largest point-of-sale hack of all time. 56 million credit cards were affected during that breach. If you're a pizza lover looking for a way to make a little extra money, it may be time to sign up for CC's Pizza Challenge. Grab a friend, scrounge up $50, and make sure you go hungry, because you won't reap the reward without eating an extremely large pizza. To take part in CC's Pizza Challenge, teams must eat every bit of a 28-inch pizza and down two 32-ounce drinks in under an hour. Pizza lovers from across all CC's locations compete against each other, and the team who completes the challenge the fastest not only goes home with a stomach full of pizza, but a grand prize of $2,500. The 2019 CC's Pizza Challenge pitted 36 teams against each other. Out of 36, only 6 were able to scarf down every bite, and they all did it in less than 30 minutes. The fastest challenge team, hailing from Chicago, named themselves the Glutton Force 5. They downed an entire 28-inch pizza in an impressive 7 minutes and 25 seconds. Most CC's restaurants are franchised. Now, thanks to the CC's Patriot program, veterans are getting a chance to join in on the front line of the business world. CC's launched their Patriot program in 2012, allowing extensive savings to qualified U.S. veterans interested in franchising CC's. CC's chief operating officer says the program was launched as a way to, quote, express our gratitude and deepen our brand's commitment to veterans. Through the CC's Patriot program, veterans pay no franchise fee. And in addition, during the first year the restaurant is open, veteran franchise owners also receive a 50% royalty fee reduction. Franchisee George Cox said in a press release that as a veteran, he is proud to be a part of a company that is dedicated to helping more veterans succeed in the civilian and business community. The new CC's Patriot program presents an opportunity to explore franchising as a career path, and I hope more veterans take advantage of it and join our CC's family. If there's one place in America other than Nashville that's synonymous with country music, it's Branson, Missouri, where some of the biggest stars in the world gather nightly to perform good old-fashioned country and western classics. It's the rootinest, tootinest country jamboree this side of Hee Haw. Wait, country music? We know what you're thinking. What the f*** does that have to do with pizza? I don't know. But actually, it turns out that the largest CC's in the whole world is located in Branson. Measuring over 13,000 square feet, the Branson CC's boasts a 40-foot buffet with expansive seating that can hold nearly 400 pizza lovers at one time. And in addition to the massive seating area, the Branson CC's also has two party rooms, the so-called ready-to-go pizza area and a $1 million game room. You may lose yourself, or at least track of time, as you make your way through 5,000 square feet of fun. Are you guilty of donating what could have been your college fund in quarters to claw machines? Well, get ready, because at the Branson CC's, it looks like you'll be doing it again. With several to choose from, they can get addicting. If you tire from raising and lowering the claw arm, head on over and roll your luck in the even more classic game of skee-ball. Or take a chance at racking up tickets on games that will win you prizes. So the next time you're heading down to Branson's 76th Strip to enjoy the famous Navy Pier Ferris Wheel, Adventure Resort, Rope Courses, and Coasters, you'll know where to stop for an energy boost. Country music and pizza. Does life get any better? A night out at the Cheesecake Factory is an extremely memorable dining experience. From the bizarre decor to the enormous portion sizes, not to mention its decadent selection of cheesecakes, this restaurant has earned a well-deserved reputation for going big. Obviously, the Cheesecake Factory is best known for its cheesecakes. While the restaurant's savory offerings are good too, cheesecakes are the main event. But what you may not know is that the restaurant originally started with just one recipe for an original cheesecake. Evelyn Overton found a recipe in a newspaper, and the rest was history. In an interview with Vice, David Overton, Evelyn's son and the actual founder of the Cheesecake Factory, said that his mother used the recipe to start her own business out of her home in Detroit. He explained, She took all of her equipment from this store in Detroit 
Detroit. She moved it into her basement, and then for 25 years, she made cheesecakes in Detroit out of her basement. According to ABC News, the recipe is pretty basic, but Evelyn clearly knew what she was doing. Her cheesecake business became a success, allowing her to help support her family without even leaving her home. Although Evelyn Overton's business started in Detroit, it was in California that it really began to pick up speed. Her son explained to Vice that at the time that Evelyn and her husband Oscar decided to move, she made cheesecakes more as a hobby than anything else. But David Overton encouraged his mother to turn her passion into a serious business pursuit. Even in California, however, things started out slowly. Oscar propelled the business by driving door-to-door -to, -door to restaurants trying to sell them cheesecakes. But David knew his parents were capable of more. He told Vice, I felt they were a little too mom and pop. I always felt I was good at business, knew I was good at business. The band I was in, I always took the business role. I moved down here and everything really started to go well. With some guidance from David, Evelyn started providing the Los Angeles area with a variety of cheesecakes in an effort to take her business to the next level. Even though the Overton family had come a long way since Evelyn first started baking cheesecakes in her Detroit basement, the first actual Cheesecake Factory restaurant didn't open until 1978, years after the first official cheesecake was made. The restaurant, a product of David's creativity, opened in Beverly Hills, California. Linda Candiotti, the vice president of guest experience at the Cheesecake Factory, was there on opening day to witness the restaurant's instant success. She shared with Vice, They were waiting in line in front of our restaurant. I cannot explain it. We opened and were busy from the first moment. People were excited. David agreed, saying, Literally in 10 minutes, every seat was full and it just kept on going. What was it that made the restaurant so popular? David shared his thoughts with Nation's Restaurant News. We just struck a chord with people for good, simple, straightforward, fresh food. The menu was so simple. We had a few burgers, a few omelets, a few salads. The one thing that always stood out was the fresh strawberry cheesecake. The restaurant's popularity only grew, and by 1991, the Cheesecake Factory had expanded to having five restaurants across the United States. An impressive feat. I've got to try this cheesecake. Oh, you know, I'm not that much of a sweet oh. tooth. Oh, my God, so creamy. Oh. When you consider how widespread the Cheesecake Factory franchise is, it's strange to remember its modest beginnings. Founder David Overton confessed to Vice, At the beginning, I didn't know it was going to be a chain. I didn't open it to be a chain. However, the popularity of the menu drove things forward. I didn't really realize what I was doing when I kept putting items on, but the items were good and people liked the big menu. As we figured out how to do that, we got busier. And then I thought, okay, I'll open one a year. Obviously, Overton ended up opening more than one a year. There are now over 200 cheesecake factories worldwide. Although the Cheesecake Factory's menus started out small, anyone who's been there in recent years can tell you that it didn't stay that way. In fact, it's more of a book than a menu. According to Thrillist, the menu is actually 21 pages long and has 250 items on it, which can make ordering a real struggle. But how did this transformation occur? Founder David Overton told Thrillist that when the Cheesecake Factory first opened, he was one of the people cooking, so the menu was relatively simple. He explained, I wasn't a chef, I had no experience in the restaurant business either, and I didn't want any chef we hired to walk out on me. So I made sure that everything we served was something I could make myself. As Overton got more comfortable cooking, he started to expand the menu, modifying dishes he'd enjoyed at other restaurants. Eventually, the growth became part of the restaurant's draw. Overton told Thrillist, Finally, I thought, well, there's nothing that America wants that we shouldn't be able to put on the menu. So we just kept at it. Four combos, extra bacon on the side, two chili cheese samplers, a basket of liver and onion rings, a catch of the day, and a steak cut in the shape of a trout. With a menu as large as the Cheesecake Factories, it would be pretty understandable for the restaurant chain to never really change what they offer. After all, with 250 items to choose from, how could anyone ever get bored of the menu? But in fact, the company switches things up more often than you'd think. Of course, the Cheesecake Factory always keeps its most popular items on the menu, but it also rotates in new items on a regular basis. In an interview with Nation's Restaurant News, David Overton explained the menu system. We've changed the menu twice a year every year for 40 years. We don't rest on our laurels. There's nothing that America wants to eat that can't go on the Cheesecake Factory menu, and I think we've improved it. It's unclear when exactly those menu changes take place, but in an interview with Thrillist, Overton mentioned that when the restaurant first started, they changed the menu in June and December. So if you want to try new items, try going in one of those months and see if you can detect any changes. 
Another characteristic that sets the Cheesecake Factory apart is its decor. Each Cheesecake Factory establishment, whether it's in Los Angeles or Austin, pretty much looks identical to every other Cheesecake Factory out there. But if you believe these interiors leave a lot to be desired, you're not alone. Even Rick McCormack, the chain's designer, knows the decor is pretty awful. In an interview with Eater, he admitted, If I tried to describe to you what it looks like, you'd probably think it was one of the most horrible-looking places around. What design elements make up the restaurant's Frankenstein-like interiors? McCormack explained, We have these French limestone floors, then we throw in some Egyptian columns, Victorian beadboard wood paneling, a really eclectic mix, which most people wouldn't be brave enough to try. But fortunately, the way we assembled them, it worked pretty well. Say what you will, but McCormack is right. The bizarre design definitely helps the Cheesecake Factory stick in people's minds. If there's one thing that most everyone who eats at the Cheesecake Factory can agree on, it's that the free brown bread served before each meal is a cut above. It's actually one of two breads in the bread basket, the other being sourdough, but the brown bread is what sets the restaurant apart. According to founder David Overton, we have him to thank for the simple yet appealing appetizer. He told Vice, I used a very good sourdough guy who was in LA, and I tasted what was then called squaw bread, and I asked him if he could make that for me in the long shape. It turned out to be delicious, and we started serving both breads on the table instead of just sourdough, and people loved it. People love it so much, it's even sold at most grocery stores. According to Delish, you can also request it for any sandwich at the restaurant, no doubt enhancing an already great culinary experience. When most people think of the Cheesecake Factory, they probably think of the wacky decor, large menu, and of course, the decadent cheesecakes. But there's another thing the restaurant is known for, and it might surprise you. Believe it or not, the Cheesecake Factory is reported to be a great place to work. In 2020, the chain was ranked as the 12th best place to work by Fortune, marking its seventh year on the publication's 100 best companies to work for list. What makes it such a great employer? For one thing, the restaurant has a conscience. Since 2008, the company has donated 5.6 million pounds of excess food to soup kitchens, shelters, transitional housing, and after-school programs. Cheesecake Factory employees have also had very positive things to say about company management. Fortune quoted one employee as saying, I would say that the openness and supportive management team is unparalleled to anywhere else I have worked. If you've ever found yourself wanting to spend your entire paycheck at Cheesecake Factory, you're not alone. The food may not be the most expensive, but the menu is so exciting that it's not hard to drop some major cash on just one dinner there. That said, you would probably never imagine spending thousands of dollars at the Cheesecake Factory week after week, right? Well, for one professional athlete, that's exactly what an obsession with the restaurant led to. According to sports casting, football player Vince Young was known to spend $5,000 per week at the Cheesecake Factory during his rookie year. To be fair, Young would often pay for everyone at his table, and when you consider the fact that his guests were typically fellow football players, his huge food bills make a bit more sense. Besides, who wouldn't want to dig into some cheesecake after a long day of football practice? The Cheesecake Factory walks a fine line between casual chain restaurant and special night out. Sure, you don't need to get all dressed up to go eat there, but it's definitely a lot nicer than your average Chili's, which is kind of the point. According to founder David Overton, the Cheesecake Factory wants to be a little nicer than your typical chain restaurant. He told Vice, We coined the phrase upscale casual dining. For the most part, if you had more money, you would come to Cheesecake. Linda Candiotti agreed, We had business people, we had stars, we had actors. Sylvester Stallone came in and I seated him and he wanted that table by the window but I had people waiting. I said, I can't give it to you, come back in a half hour. A moderately priced restaurant that's so successful it's turning away Sylvester Stallone? That's about as upscale casual as it gets. There's one defining feature of the Cheesecake Factory that we haven't mentioned yet. When dining at the restaurant, you may notice that it's nearly impossible to finish an entire Cheesecake Factory entree in one sitting. These are the biggest salads in the history of mankind. I know. I'm already full and I haven't even made a dent. I'm out of salad. What you may not know is that the restaurant has a reason for that. David Gordon, the president of the Cheesecake Factory, explained to Vice, The portions are large because we want people to share. We want people to have experiential dining. Founder David Overton says his parents had a hand in the portion sizes as well. He told Thrillist, Growing up, my parents used to go down to Miami and gush about the large portions they commonly saw down there. Again, I didn't have restaurant experience, but it just seemed like the right thing to do for our business. And really, who doesn't love those big Cheesecake Factory portions that the chain is known for? If you can't finish your meal, you can take it home and eat it later. It's a win-win.
Mod Pizza is a fast casual pizza joint that's taking the world by storm and growing at a ridiculous pace. We decided to take a close look at what Mod is all about, from the company's philosophy to its slew of topping options. This is the untold truth of Mod Pizza. In comparison to pizza giants like Pizza Hut and Domino's, Mod is definitely the new kid on the block. The chain story began in Seattle, Washington in 2008. Founders Scott and Allie Svensson were inspired to open their first pizza joint in their hometown, but not because they felt the world really needed another pizza place. Speaking to Q13 Fox in 2016, Scott recalled something Allie told him right off the bat. Listen, the last thing the world needs is another pizza chain. So if we're going to do this, it has to have more meaning. The Svensons wanted to create a workplace where employees could truly thrive. As Ali explains it, We are unapologetically for profit, but our purpose is to make a positive social impact. Scott's background was in investment banking. Ali formerly had a career in the publishing industry. They're a truly unique pair. And we, we started dating when, we were, when I was 15. A teenage romance spawned at Bellevue High School. In 1995, the couple changed course and opened Seattle Coffee Company in London. They both left their day jobs to open the new business, and the leap of faith certainly paid off. The Svensons sold Seattle Coffee Company to Starbucks for close to $90 million in 1998. Ten years later, they moved back to Seattle, explored the pizza scene, and Mod Pizza was born. We're a overnight success ten years in the making. <laughs> It's not often that a company makes a concerted effort to hire people with criminal histories. But Mod Pizza isn't your average company. Their hiring practices are truly unique. One of the reasons the Svensons wanted to open the restaurant was to offer a great place to work. And they've embraced a wide variety of employees with different types of backgrounds from the start. As one employee puts it, People have been out of the workforce for a long time. It's single mothers who have limited availability. they got to raise kids and stuff like that. It's, it's people who've been in the military. Mod Pizza calls it impact hiring. According to Entrepreneur, the company happily partners with community organizations devoted to offering career counseling for people who were incarcerated. I just got released from federal prison on a drug charge. They also work closely with the Monarch School, an organization that helps people with ADHD and autism find jobs. As Ali Svensson told Entrepreneur, people go to job fairs for impact employees and hire two or three people. But we just hire that way. Mod doesn't keep track of its number of impact hires, but those hires reportedly prove to be some of the most successful. A lot has happened since that first Mod Pizza opened in downtown Seattle in 2008. The chain has opened new locations left and right, growing at a ridiculous pace. In May 2019, National Restaurant News reported that Mod Pizza was the fastest growing top 200 restaurant chain for a second year in a row. In 2019 alone, Mod Pizza saw a 44.7% growth in sales for a total of $390.7 million. In May 2019, the company announced its plan to rapidly increase growth with a goal of 1,000 locations over a five-year period, ultimately creating more than 14,000 new jobs. The next expansion is set to develop locations in Canada, with their first expansion project dedicated to Vancouver Island in British Columbia. If there isn't a Mod Pizza near you, it's only a matter of time. Walking into Mod is a pizza lover's dream come true. You can basically get anything and everything on your pizza. First, you choose your crust, or there's even a salad option, if that's how you want to roll. As for toppings, there are six different types of sauces to get the party started, including pesto and barbecue sauce, along with seven different types of cheese, including ricotta, feta, and gorgonzola. You can choose one of nine different meat options, or choose all of them if you're feeling wild. But don't forget to leave room for all of the veggies. You can choose hot peppers, roasted garlic, asparagus, and basically any vegetable you'd ever want. Best of all, customers never have to pay more for additional toppings. Sweet deal, no? But at Mod, they all come out the same price. No catch, no surprises, no problem. Budgeting can be tough when you're in college, but Mod makes it easy. That's because you already know exactly how much money you're going to spend there. The Svensons built the pizza chain on the idea of helping people enjoy great, delicious food on a fixed income. And college students should definitely get in on the deal. As we mentioned, the price is the same whether you add 2 or 22 ingredients to your pizza. 
Writing for the Enterprise Record in Chico, California, one college student discovered that Mod Pizza is the perfect place to go with just $11 in your pocket. That's enough to buy an incredibly filling lunch at Mod, and you'll even have some leftovers for later. Any student can pile the toppings on high, making their pizza more filling and ultimately stretching their dollar. At the end of the day, it's just a great deal for college students and anyone else. Brazilian cowboys, massive knives, and unlimited gluttony. We must be talking about a Brazilian steakhouse. Texas de Brazil, to be exact. Enjoy all you can eat, but don't expect a doggy bag. Prepare to gorge yourself in savory meat. Obviously, when you think of a Brazilian steakhouse like Texas de Brazil, you might assume that it was founded by someone from either Texas or Brazil. But in actuality, the founder of the chain restaurant, Salim Azrawi, immigrated to the United States from Lebanon, and his story is pretty inspiring. According to D Magazine, Azrawi came to the United States in 1981, along with one million others, as war raged on in his home country of Lebanon. The war lasted from 1975 to 1990, and as he told D Magazine, quote, war became part of my life. So how does the chain manage to feature such delicious, authentic Brazilian cuisine? In 1997, Azrawi and his business partner visited Brazil and ate at the restaurant of chef Ivandro Carignato. They were obviously impressed with his skills, and the fact that he was an actual gaucho was also appealing. Because of that, the three worked together to open Texas Day Brazil in the Dallas area, with one founding principle. They wouldn't change the traditional preparation and serving of the churrasco dinner. But what exactly does that mean? If you've never eaten at a Brazilian steakhouse, then you might be a little confused as to what makes it so different from other steakhouses. And honestly, the answer is everything. Eating at a Brazilian steakhouse allows you to experience a true Brazilian dinner, something Texas Day Brazil is definitely proud of. Specifically, Texas Day Brazil was inspired by a tradition from southern Brazil called churrasco, in which local cowboys would cook large meals with slow-roasted meats cooked over the fire, and a large array of seasonal vegetables as well as regional specialties. The meats were the main star of the show, though, and today are brought to the table to be hand-carved in front of diners. And that's basically what happens when you dine in at a Texas Day Brazil. You are served a large array of meats right at your table, as well as a large salad bar with seemingly endless toppings. It truly is an authentic Brazilian steakhouse experience. After years of hard work, planning, and a strong desire to create an authentic Brazilian experience in Texas, Azrawi and Carignato opened the first location of Texas Day Brazil in 1998 in Addison, Texas. As Azrawi told D Magazine, it wasn't an easy process, but it was worth it. If you put in the time and effort, you will succeed one way or another. It required me to dig as deep as I've ever dug. Opening a new restaurant is never an easy endeavor, but from their first location onward, Azrawi never gave up. And with such an original concept and great team behind his back, it's no wonder it became such a success. Eating at Texas Day Brazil is an experience unlike anything you've ever had before. First, the dine-in menu isn't your typical menu where you decide on a single entree. Texas Day Brazil has a fixed price menu that gives you access to a ton of food. Then, you'll get your fill of the huge salad bar that's a step above your typical salad bar. At Texas Day Brazil, there are fresh vegetables, charcuterie items, and even smoked salmon and homemade lobster bisque. You can go back to the salad bar as many times as you want, too, so don't stress if you aren't able to try everything at once. And you'll also be greeted by gauchos, serving a variety of tableside meats. The gauchos walk around the restaurant with different meats for you to choose from, so try not to fill up on the salad bar as hard as that might be. Typically, when the economy struggles, so do restaurants. People stop eating out as much, so it makes sense that restaurants would suffer the consequences. But for Texas Day Brazil, a bad economy can't stop them from expanding and opening even more locations. According to Nation's Restaurant News, while many chain establishments struggled in 2013 and the years prior, Texas Day Brazil wasn't one of them. Their director of operations told the publication that the success of Texas Day Brazil was due in large part to the chain being strategic and smart in how they expanded. 
In this economy, there are a lot of good deals to be had. People are willing to negotiate and provide better terms for businesses. At the same time, a lot of restaurants are folding, and there are spaces available. It's all a matter of taking advantage of the good deals. In 2020, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, Texas de Brazil responded by offering more to-go options and taking reservations to keep indoor dining safe and responsible. That said, the chain has had to close at least one location because of the pandemic. But it seems other locations have remained open, which is pretty impressive. A struggling economy can't stop Texas de Brazil. If you're looking for an economically friendly meal, then Texas Day Brazil probably isn't for you. Yes, it's a lot of food, but since your dine-in options are mostly eating from the price-fixed menu, you'll be paying a premium price for all that food. Specifically, depending on the location of the restaurant, one meal will cost anywhere from $42.99 to $48.99. So while Texas Day Brazil is certainly a unique dining experience, it's also by no means a cheap night out. And because of that, you won't find a Texas Day Brazil in just any neighborhood. Malcolm Knapp, president of a restaurant consulting firm, told Nation's Restaurant News, quote, Texas Day Brazil is an upscale brand, so it can't go everywhere. It needs the right location. Because Texas Day Brazil is an upscale dining experience, there's no real kids menu. So it's understandable that you might assume it's not really a kid-friendly restaurant. But there is a perk to bringing your kids as you don't have to pay full price for them. Specifically, as long as you have one full-priced adult meal, your kids can get a pretty great discount on their own Brazilian steakhouse experience. If your child is two or younger, they can eat for free, while children up to five years old are only $5 for the authentic Brazilian meal. And kids up to 12 are half off your regular full-price dinner cost. So don't be afraid to bring your kids along to Texas Day Brazil, as they won't cost a ton and they'll definitely get full and have plenty to choose from. Another huge thing that sets Texas Day Brazil apart from other restaurant chains is that you don't get to take any food home with you. It's the policy at Texas Day Brazil to not allow customers to take home to-go bags after dining in. According to the chain's website, they believe that restaurant goers pretty much already get their fair share of food while in the restaurant, saying, Our continuous dining concept does not allow for to-go containers or bags for uneaten portions of food from the salad area, meats, and specialty or side items. But if you find yourself hungry for dessert, you can order that separately and take those home. It makes sense that Texas Day Brazil wouldn't allow leftovers, as the chain is basically an upscale all-you-can-eat buffet. So don't be surprised when you don't get a to-go box at the end of your meal. While Texas Day Brazil might be pretty stringent about taking home leftovers after a delicious meal, there is one way you can enjoy traditional Brazilian churrasco at home, ordering Texas Day Brazil to go. Yes, it won't be the same as getting to eat at the actual restaurant, but it's a pretty great deal if you want to stay home in your sweatpants and even save some cash. As it turns out, Texas Day Brazil's to-go family packs are a pretty good deal. As of November 2020, the meal comes with two different types of meat, enough for four people, for $69. The meal also comes with three sides that are super tasty too. A green salad, fried plantains, and potatoes au gratin. According to a review in the OC Register, the takeout from Texas Day Brazil is solid because the meats are sliced nicely and hold their flavor even after delivery. Considering the cost of Texas Day Brazil, it might not exactly be the kind of place you just randomly decide to go to on a Tuesday night. But for the frugal-minded who still hunger for a unique dining experience, we have a life hack for you. The bar menu is cheaper. From the bar menu, you can actually order quite a lot of food. There's lobster bisque, an antipasto platter, chicken breast, garlic sirloin, sausage, and even filet with bacon. It's not an endless array of roasted meats like you get in the restaurant proper, but you can certainly get a full meal just at the bar at Texas Day Brazil. So if you aren't super hungry, don't care for the salad bar, or just want to save some money, then it might be a smart idea to order from the bar menu so you can pick and choose what you want and pay less. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys!
Texas to Brazil isn't just a full-on Brazilian churrasco experience. It's also an interactive restaurant where you really get to be pretty hands-on with your meal. Obviously, you get to plate your own salad from the salad bar and pick and choose what you want to eat, but that's not all. When you decide you're ready for meat to be brought to your table, you'll flip over a disc on your table from red to green to indicate you're waiting for the parade of meats to be brought to you. Then, when the gauchos bring the meat, you'll actually use your own tongs to grab the meat as they slice it and place it on your plate. Basically, when you eat at Texas Day Brazil, expect to do a little work yourself, though it's all pretty fun and entertaining. Again, this is an authentic experience, so definitely enjoy it and remember that it's not every day you get to grab meat being served to you tableside. There's one restaurant chain out there who claims to have the meats, and surprisingly, it's not Texas Day Brazil. Arby's, we have the meats. But there's meat, and then there's Texas Day Brazil meat. So just how many meats exactly can you expect to eat at Texas Day Brazil, and what are they? Well, it's important to note that not everything will be available at every Texas Day Brazil. But for the most part, here's what cuts of meat you can expect. Pork loin, Brazilian sausage, leg of lamb, bacon-wrapped chicken breast, lamb chops, bacon-wrapped filet mignon, braised beef ribs, barbecued pork ribs, parmesan drumettes, flank steak, and more. If you don't see the meat you want to eat being served, you can definitely ask when it will be available and they'll do their best to get it to you. Sorry, Arby's. Someone took your meat. Between all that meat and the salad bar, you're probably thinking you'd be pretty full. But there's more. Texas Day Brazil also serves tableside Brazilian cheese bread and garlic mashed potatoes. So if you head in anytime soon, be sure to bring your appetite. Clearly, Texas Day Brazil knows a thing or two about running a successful business. The chain restaurant has survived over 20 years in the industry and has continued to expand and open up new locations all over, despite so many other restaurants shutting down or stopping their expansion. But even though Texas Day Brazil brings in a lot of money, they're also very charitable. For instance, in August 2021, Texas Day Brazil announced that they had raised $33,000 for the American Red Cross to help members of the military and their families deal with all the challenges that come with military service. As Rawi said, we proudly support the American Red Cross program serving our military veterans and families and feel fortunate to have the ability to craft a campaign that provides our guests with an opportunity to raise funds that go directly to those who protect our freedoms. Texas A Brazil is also involved in other charities like St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital and the Freedom Alliance. For every $5 that you donate, you're gonna get $5 to use on the restaurant when you come back. Clearly, giving back is just as important to them as providing succulent meat. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more mashed videos about your favorite foods, chefs, and more are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.